Hello, uh, my name is Ben Root. I am a quote unquote core dev of Matplotlib. Um, yeah, my commit histories in the past couple years have gone down, but you know, I'm still a very active member and uh, I'll be presenting to you the basically the introduction to Matplotlib uh, for you all today. So we'll get started firing up the Jupyter Notebook. Um, this tutorial originally derived from something I made back in 2013. Um, so I, and then also originally meant for my coworkers. Uh, and so I had to even do like an introduction to NumPy thing. We can skip that. Uh, we'll go straight to part one. All right. I'm hoping everything here is big enough for you guys to see comfortably. I know I have terrible vision, which is very interesting because I work on a visualization library, but uh, <laughs> the blind leading the blind, right? Uh, so I like to make sure these things are nice and big for everybody. Okay. Oop. So. So uh, I've been working on Matplotlib uh, since about uh, 2010, uh, when I finally got fed up with MATLAB. And, uh, and then finally I got involved and I kept running into bugs with Matplotlib. And eventually John Hunter, who originally created the library, he got so fed up with me sending him uh, patches that he finally gave me commit rights. This is how you get involved in open source programming, by the way. You annoy the core developers enough that finally they say, you do it yourself. You go ahead and commit it. This had actually directly led me to getting my job, my, my career job that I absolutely love right now and I've been in for five years now and uh, working for atmospheric and environmental research uh, because of me sending so many emails and doing so many discussions on the mailing list. And, uh, so Matplotlib can get you a job. Just saying, yeah. This has also led to me writing a book. So please go to your friendly neighborhood uh, web, Amazon web page <laughs> and uh, check out my thing. Uh, this, this book here will cover topics that are not gonna be covered in the tutorial today because they're a bit more advanced topics and we'll, I'll, I'll explain uh, exactly why they're separate. But for those who want to learn about how to do interactive uh, plotting, this is the book for you. There is no other book that does this. So Matplotlib, you have to go back to the context. Matplotlib started off back in 2001. John Hunter, he was getting fed up with MATLAB. How many people here are MATLAB uh, users hoping maybe one day to become defectors? Good, good. I, I was there with you 10 years ago. I was there with you. Um, he got fed up with MATLAB and he went to code up something himself and, uh, and, it, and through several iterations it finally became Matplotlib. And so it was designed from the very beginning to be a library that mimics a lot of the behavior of MATLAB. And so that means, for those of you who are not familiar with MATLAB, is that you just say plot and boom, a figure window pops up in front of you and you can interact with it, move it around, pan, zoom, you can resize that window, do anything, and then when you're done, you hit the save button and you have yourself nice publication quality uh, figures available for you to use uh, for your papers and things like that. John Hunter was working on a biomedical scan imaging and such and he needed the figures to look perfect for his papers. Um, and so that was the origin of it and that's why Matplotlib became so popular in the Python community because it mimicked an API that was very familiar to many scientists in the community and it produced pixel perfect, uh, we like to say pixel perfect, uh, images for you without being obtuse. And for those of you who have worked with other plotting libraries, you know exactly what I mean by being obtuse. Then on top of that, it became even more. 
uh, rather than, in order to achieve that goal of being an interactive plotting library, it had to work on a wide variety of platforms, so Windows, Linux, and Mac. It had to work on a wide variety of toolkit, uh, GUI toolkits, so uh, WEX, GTK, TK, QT. It had to work on all of them. Uh, we even have one for Cocoa Ag and uh, uh, Cocoa and stuff like that. That was all the Mac stuff. Um, it had to work. And it had to produce the same result across all those platforms. So for the big order, a big, big tall order, but John Hunter managed to actually, and others managed to uh, get going and make that stuff work. Text rendering is also another very important aspect of that, uh, which I won't get into, but it was a very important aspect because scientists need to have their text rendered perfectly because these things are going into public uh, publications, you know, such as science and nature and things like that, and so it needs to look right or else they'll get rejected by the editor. Uh, so that's what you guys are jumping into. This is the historical context for Matplotlib. It is one of the oldest uh, SciPy packages out there. There's only one other package that I know of that's older, and, that, and that's IPython. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, you guys are, you know, coming on to something here that's uh, been around for a while, and uh, it, it is what it is, and it does its job very well, and unfortunately that does mean that it carries a lot of historical baggage because of that. And so there's a lot of idiosyncrasies and such that you need to, once you understand it, it goes, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense in that context. But that's where I'm hoping my tutorial is going to help you with. Also, the documentation online tries to help explain a lot of the reasoning and a lot of the, the way to think about things so that it starts to make sense to people who are not just coming from MATLAB. It needs to also make sense to those who are coming from R, those who are coming from uh, other uh, graphing tools as well. So, and those who are just coming completely fresh and hadn't come from any uh, previous tool at all. We need to make sure that all of you guys can get to learn and understand. So uh, we have, the documentation has uh, FAQs, it has examples, it has uh, direct API documentation. We have these things to help suit many different uh, people's needs uh, and where the and, uh, experience level so that we can help you guys out in different ways. What I consider is most important is the gallery. Um, what ends up happening, unlike in other libraries that you guys have learned about in the past, couple days, uh, with Matplotlib, a lot of the things you want to do, you're trying to describe images. You want your plot to be, you know, organized this way, and you need your plot, you know, you need your titles over here, and you need the font to be this type. And to ask those questions in a Google search or whatever, it's, that's rather difficult to do. But the gallery lets you browse through a whole bunch of pre-made canned examples that cover a wide variety of things you can do in Matplotlib. And when you look through those images, you can then see the pieces of things you want. You go, oh, so that's how you make the background black. Oh, that's, I see in that one, that's how I do a polar plot. And I see in that one, that's how I can have my uh, markers uh, in this shape or something. You can see the pieces of it, and then when you click on any one of those images, it'll take you to the source code that made it, and the source code for these examples are very, uh, at least I hope they're very well uh, commented. If you feel that they're not commented, please submit some uh, pull requests uh, to help us further explain them more. But they're pretty well documented and they're, and they're very targeted in what they do. So that way you're not getting lost in the gigantic huge example that do like 50 different things. They focus on one or two different things in each image so that you can see how do I do this, how do I do that. And eventually, when you, get, when you use the gallery more and more, you actually then start getting used to the gallery and you keep referring back to the gallery all the time. Go, I remember, I one time saw that image. And you go back to the gallery and you go find that image. You go, yeah, that's how you do it, right. I do this all the time. 10 years now, I've been working on Matplotlib. I still go back to the gallery to get things, to find a thing that I would remember seeing some image that came through once or something like that. And feel free, if you feel that you've come up with a nifty little graph or whatever, we love examples to add to the gallery so that uh, it makes it, the gallery much more useful for everyone else. 
Um, some other ways to learn more about Mat Mat Matplotlib, as I mentioned, the mailing list is, that is exactly how I got my job. And so uh, the mailing list is a very, very useful resource. You can talk to the developers directly and talk to other users like yourselves who might uh, have encountered similar problems as yourself. Uh, we're very friendly on this mailing list, and no question is stupid, seriously. I, I, we, we see questions, and people always apologize. No, don't apologize. Just ask your question. We love for you guys using our software to get the things done, because we're helping to advance your science. So in some way, it actually improved my impact factor, so I kind of like that. So. Um, we also uh, on Stack Overflow, so if you have karma points you want to boost up, you can help answer each other's questions on Stack Overflow. We also recently joined up with Gitter, which is sort of like a chat system for, uh, for Git projects, uh, GitHub projects. So that's another place you can go to if you have a GitHub account. And as I mentioned at Matplotlib, we host the project on uh, GitHub and bug reports and issues, things like that. Uh, one thing we have are MEPs, uh, they're uh, Matplotlib enhancement proposals. So let's say you're not quite ready to actually implement a feature, but you've got yourself a very well-formed idea of something that you would like to see in Matplotlib. You can actually put together a map that describes in detail uh, what you're thinking of you like as an improvement to Matplotlib and you can submit that, and then we can refine it and things like that. And when things, these things get well writ, uh, written out, maybe by then you might be willing to try implementing it, or one of us, other developers, may be inspired by it and go, ah, yes, I know how I can implement that, and we'll go ahead and implement it. And your map may be uh, accepted for inclusion into Matplotlib. And I mean, and it really, honestly, it feels really neat to see a feature that you make being used by people all around the world all the time. It feels fantastic. It's much better than any, any of the scientific software I wrote as, as an undergrad. <laughs> um, so moving away from documentation, stuff like that, you're gonna hear me mention uh, backends. Uh, this is a crucial part of Matplotlib, is, and one of the reasons why Matplotlib became so successful is because it works on so many different uh, platforms. And so Matplotlib provides to you guys a single interface for you to deal with. You don't have to deal, worry about whether or not you're on Windows or you're on Linux and you're on a Mac. The same Matplotlib script that you write, same Python script that you write that uses Matplotlib will work on all three. And it doesn't matter which GUI you're using or things like that, it will work. What Matplotlib does is it swaps out different backends depending on which platform you, you're using. And so sometimes you do run into the odd little bugs and that may be backend dependent. And so sometimes when you go to the mailing list and you're reporting a problem and you know, something's not quite right, one of the most common questions you'll be asked is which backend you're using. Because sometimes we'll find a bug that way that there might have been a mistake made in one of the backends and then no one else in the world is running into it because you're the only one using that backend. It happens. Uh, that's, but that's what we mean by backend. And so the way you find out which backend you're using, you'll import matplotlib. You'll, oh, the other thing we always want to know is your version. So that's how you get your version, and that's how you get your backend. So right now, I am running version 2.0.2, which is the latest bug fix release. And I'm using what's known as TKAG. Don't worry about what the detail of what that means. It's, that's, the name is what's important to us developers if you're reporting a bug. So that's how you find out uh, that information. But 99.99% of the time, you will never need to worry about this. Seriously, you just, it, we designed Matplotlib so that this is not something you have to worry about. It's only when you run into an issue that you then have to at least tell us which one it is. Um, so IPython, IPython being basically the interactive version of Python, um, we have special uh, hooks with IPython so that, uh, and with Jupyter so that uh, our plots are interactive inside the notebook. And there's a few different backends for doing this. The one we're gonna use for this tutorial is called MBAG, which was the notebook ag backend. Um, 
the reason why I chose this one is because then, uh, one, it, it demonstrates how one would explicitly state which backend you're using, but then it also forces you, us to use uh, the same sort of commands we would use as if we were uh, running a Python script. IPython, they kind of like making things a little bit simple so you don't have to actually say to show a figure or something like that, that it would just pop up right, right away. I want to make things feel more like you're writing a Python script. And so we're going to uh, use MBA because it lets me uh, force that. But you don't have to. There are other options you can use with Jupyter. So here, so we're matplotlib.use mbag. That's how we'll activate this particular um, backend for our tutorial. But this use command, you would never use this in, you, you would not need this particular uh, command in your Python script. You would never say use mbag in your regular Python script. You would only use this in a Jupyter notebook, maybe, and just in this context. Okay, you guys weren't here, to hear, weren't, weren't here to hear me drone. You guys were here to see me do some plots. So, just to make sure that we're all on the same vocabulary, let's piece apart what a plot is. All right? Uh, so this is a figure window, see, called a figure, and it's going to contain, it's, this is the figure window, it looks like a regular GUI window, but it's the figure, and on the figure, you will have a variety of different things. You're going to have what's called the axes, or subplot, they're mostly synonymous. Uh, you'll also see a, a toolbar, sometimes it's up on top, sometimes it's down on bottom. Uh, You'll, so the, the axes in the subplot is this area here. You have the y-axis and the x-axis. You're going to have ticks and labels and other sort of things. This is where the uh, graph gets drawn. This, these are the names of the things that we're going to be dealing with. So that makes sure that we're all on the common uh, thing. So the figure contains the subplot or the axes. The axes contain the the two or potentially more axis objects. And a figure can contain multiple subplots or multiple axes. And you'll see examples of us doing that uh, shortly. Most of the plotting can happen in, in an axis or a subplot uh, uh, object. And that is the white area that you saw in the figure. And uh, we'll be, we'll, you'll see commands on how to create those Pretty easy. So, let's. Uh, and the, these are going to be the typical typical commands that we're going to use pretty much in every single script. You want to import NumPy, and you're going to want to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. This is a common convention, a de facto standard. You'll see a lot of examples on the web where in which they make this assumption that NumPy is imported as mp, and that the pyplot module is Import it as PLT. All right, so let's just start off with the very first thing. Let's make a figure. Nothing happened. Why? Because by default, Matplotlib will not show you anything until it's told to do so. Again, this is the reason why I chose the MBAG backend, because this behaved most like your usual backend when you write up a, uh, a Python script with matplotlib. So by default, the, it's not interactive in the sense that the very first graphing command you do automatically forces the window to show up. It will just go, okay, I have a figure, good. Nothing gonna show yet. You need to actually say, when you're ready for this thing to show up, you need to say plot.show. Boom, right there. Now there's nothing on our figure here, but that is a figure. Now, we just saw four, lot, four commands. Importing NumPy, you didn't even need to do that for this, but you imported matplotlib, you created a figure and you showed it. Those three commands, that is gonna work on every single platform, computer platform you do, so long as it has a monitor. It'll work, 
we even have people who have it working on Solaris. So it's going to work. We have, we have people doing it on Raspberry Pis. It works. So there's a lot of work that went into making this happen and making this thing work for you. So, uh, so what can you do with this figure? Well, not much. Uh, in, in, especially not since it doesn't really have anything to plot yet, but you, you got your, uh, your toolbar here, the home. So let's say you uh, did some zooming, did some panning and stuff, and you want to go back to the way, the way it looked like originally, you'll hit that home button. Back will go back, you know, you, you, do, you made one pan motion, you hit back, it'll go back a pan motion, kind of like in a browser, you go forward a uh, particular interactive motion. Uh, there's how you would pan, that's how you draw a, uh, a zoom box, and that's, and then finally, this uh, floppy disk icon, which apparently I've been told no millennial, uh, millennial knows what this means. You know, I like to think that it's the five inch one. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can resize this plot, you can resize this figure. Hmm? The icon what? Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, I know. We're, we're, maybe we're a little bit behind the times in this respect, yes, but damn it, I, I, I like that stupid icon, you know? <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I don't like the computer being too smart. Um, so you just saw I was able to resize this figure. Well, you could also ahead of time specify what the size of that figure should be, and you'll, you'll give it a tuple of uh, width and height, and those width and height is in inches. Now, it's something someone asked a couple years ago when they did this. Oh, no, it's not five inches on my monitor. <sighs> That's not what we mean, all right? It's, it's, it's that many inches. You know, when you save it in that data format, you record how many inches it should display at and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, uh, a lot of people don't know what size to use, a good rough estimate size to use. I love this function called Fig Aspect, um, where you, you say I want it to be twice as tall as wide, so you pass two into Fig Aspect, and it will produce for you a figure size that is reasonable and is twice as tall as it is wide. Wonderful, wunderbar, great. So it's a useful function to have. You know, if you ever want to be able to control uh, aspect, otherwise it's just going to be roughly square. So by default. All right. So the figure by itself is not very useful. So let's actually get into something a little more interesting. Uh, let's add a subplot. Oh, MATLAB users, you may be very happy or very very concerned seeing this wonderful little. Uh, idiosyncrasy of MATLAB, 111 or 170, whatever. Um, yeah, we support that. You don't have to, but we support it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it was a very smart API decision on the MATLAB part, but we support it. Uh, so now, look, we got ourselves a figure. It has a title, it has a y axis label, it has an x axis label. And it has uh, a default uh, x limits and y limits. What more could you ask for? Um, so some things you may notice, uh, we use this thing, axe.set. It's a nifty little convenience function. So you can set multiple things all at once. So we can set the x limits. We can set the y limits. Set it title, you could set a label for X and Y, very nice and nifty. You could also explicitly set each individual value yourself. We have act.set Y label, act.set title. We, ha we have individual functions, uh, methods as well. We give you a plethora of choices. 
All right. Um, there are times where uh, you want to use the individual setter. Uh, for example, when you're setting, let's say, the Y label, you get back a text object that you can then mess around with. Or, uh, you can also uh, be able to set additional properties for that uh, object as well in that call. But when you're just simply setting a label and you don't care what the label size is and you don't care about you know, which font and what color it is, that's a very useful thing to have. Again, Matplot, Matplotlib tries to make things easy, but also does not try to be in your way by forcing you to indicate every single mundane detail. So uh, what, what we just saw, the set uh, command up here, this is the equivalent. You see that the, the very last one returned back to us a text object. So each call to set X label, set Y label, each set title would have returned back an object that we could have played with if we wanted to. You'll see examples of that later. Um, so clearly, there are times where you want to use set, there is time where you want to explicitly set each property. All right. I bet you're really champ champing at the bit for uh, for getting, uh, getting some plotting done here. So let's just introduce ourselves to two very simple common plot commands, plot and scatter. So here we created our figure. We created an axes object to, or a subplot axes, uh, subplot object, one, one, one. And we're going to plot some very simple data. There's our X data, there's our Y data, and we're going to give it a color. And there's our scatter plot. There's our X data, there's our Y data. And we'll give it some color. Uh, oh, and uh, specify some line width. We'll, we'll go into more detail about this later, but you can spec these are all optional things to specify. You don't have to give them. And we'll set some X limits and then show it. All right, and there we go. We have ourselves some uh, triangle markers from the scatter call and the plot command drew ourselves a line. Very simple. At least I hope it's simple. It's not complicated at all. It's going to do exactly what you tell it to do. So here you just saw me use uh, the, uh, what's called the object-oriented interface, where I created the figure, and then from the figure I created a, a subplot axis to use, and that for that axis I called the plot for that axis, I called the scatter for that axis. I set the X limits for that axis. I was explicit. I said that I want the scatter to be in this axis. I want the plot to be in this axis. It is tedious, but it says exactly what you mean it to say. This is the preferred uh, style of coding things up in Matplotlib, and we highly encourage it. It's called the object-oriented uh, interface and it removed ambiguity. However, we recognize that not everyone uses Matplotlib to do, you know, operationalize uh, five nines, uh, uptime, you know, battle tested type stuff. Sometimes you're just simply starting up IPython and you just want to type away at a couple things. You don't want to be typing out all this extra stuff. The equivalent command from what we just saw above is this, where you just take the plot, dot plot, and it will plot it. And you do plot dot scatter, and it will scatter it. And then you do plot dot xlim, and it will set your x limits. Why does this work? Because it made assumptions. When you first call plot dot plot, in fact, I'll show it, it will run, it's going to produce the same exact plot. Why did this work? Because the pi plot interface it assumes that you're working on the current figure. And it assumes that you're working on the current axis. Those of you coming from MATLAB are very familiar with GCF and GCA. That's what is going on here, is that if there is no figure already made, PyPlot will create one for you. 
If there is no axes made and you're doing a plotting command, it will create one for you. And it will always be whatever the current one is. This can cause confusion if you're doing more complicated plots. And that's where then you want to use the object-oriented interface. But for very simple plots like this, this is very concise, nice and easy to use, and is perfectly fine to do, provided you know when not to use it. Um, so one thing, one justification I do have for this is uh, PEP20. Uh, PEP20 is the Python enhancement proposal number 20, and that is the 20 uh, the, the Zen of Python, which is that the 20 rules of Python of which 19 were written. So uh, one of them is explicit is better than implicit. So think of PyPlot as the implicit interface while the object-oriented interface is the explicit one. It makes it really clear what exactly you mean every single time when you do it that way. All right, so we got we done, done an example where we created a figure and we added one plot to it. But what if you need two plots side by side in one figure? Well, plot dot subplots. I'm gonna. So before we showed you, you created a figure and you added a subplot. That's an old interface uh, and derived mainly from uh, MATLAB. This is a n somewhat newer interface that we added it about a, a, a few years ago. Uh, plot dot subplots s at the end, uh, where you it will create the figure for you and return back for you an array of uh, subplot objects. So you say that you want two rows and two columns. You're going to get back a figure object as if you had called plot dot figure, and you're going to get back all four of your axes object all at once, rather than you add one axis, you do your plotting, add the next axis, you do your plotting. That's the old interface with uh, subplot. This is the new, you know, nice shiny, you know, all, all the cool kids are doing it interface. Um, you get back a NumPy array. And in this case, because it is two rows and two columns, it's going to be a 2D NumPy array. And each element, and it's going to be arranged in the same way that it would appear. So let's just quickly show what this looks like. Look at that. Nice, simple defaults. You got yourself four perfectly valid subplots that you could work with. Um, if what you're specifying is just one row, you get a 1D array. If you're specifying just one subplot, then you actually get, your, get back just a scalar single axis object. But you can index this 2D array like this. So, so the subplot at 0, 0, subplot at 0, 1, subplot at 1. This looks like just regular in indexing with NumPy. I did that to set the title for each one of these. Upper left, upper right, lower right, lower left. It worked. Did exactly what you expected to do. And then if you don't pass any arguments, it's as if you said one row, one column. So anytime you see the combination figure equal plot dot figure and axe equal fig dot add subplot one one one, that wonderful one one one, um, you can replace that with just this one single line right here. And it's identical. So if you see old code swimming around in the internet out there, you can just mentally just replace that with that and it's identical. Um, so you, you'll sometimes see me go back and forth between using the two interfaces. That's just simply for demonstration purposes and things like that. Uh, this is also good for regular gridded layouts. If you want more complicated layout, where in which let's say you want a subplot to span two columns or span one or more, uh, two or more rows or something, there are other tools that you will need to go to to use that, and in which case you have to then create your own figure first, and then you start mucking about with that. But for, again, Matplotlib tries to make the easy things easy for everybody, the ones that, the, the use cases that most people want.
So, let's, can you, as an exercise, reproduce this figure right here? We have ourselves three subplots with a sine wave and uh, a title for each one of these subplots. Also notice no ticks, labels, anything like that. So let's uh, come down to this example here. I give you a little something to start with. So import NumPy, import matplotlib as plot. I even give you your data. I even give you those uh, title names. Let's uh, spend five minutes. Can you reproduce that figure? And uh, indicate on Slack when you've uh, done so. I, if someone can make a check box or something to, for people to indicate. So five minutes. Let's take a look. So the uh, quick question was, is there a title that is overarching of all titles? You know, the, the super title, if you will. Yes, there's a function called subtitle. It's the super title. So uh, it's, it's kept at the very, very top of the figure. And it always looks absolutely squashed and terrible. But yes, it is called the subtitle. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, shift enter is a really great way to all right, uh, so let's uh, catch up here. Uh, not meaning to utterly show my sneaky way for how you guys can cheat in all the future exercises, but. There you go, just reproduce the figure right here. So, uh, so something you're gonna see here, you're gonna see used a few times, plot.style.use classic. So matplotlib right now is on version 2.0. It took us two years to go from version 1.5 to version 2.0. And in 2.0, we actually made practically no API changes, but we did do a massive style overhaul because people said that our plot looked old. Yes, but you know what? When people were complaining about it, I created the style called classic because it's not old, it's classic. Um, I could have also gone with retro, but I, I felt like not enough people would know what that meant, so. Um, so classic, so a lot of things change with this thing, and so from time to time, when you do really do wanna keep the old style, or you're trying to avoid certain differences in behavior, you can go to the classic mode and you restore some older behavior. And since I said that this presentation would, would allow you to use version 1.5 or version 2.0, there can be some examples where I'll say, use the classic mode, that's what it's for, just so that way the people on 2.0 will see the same things as the people on version 1.5. So, uh, here, we created uh, those subplots, two, uh, three rows, and we're going to loop over them. Remember, this is a 1D NumPy array, so you can just do a zip on it. And then we provide the Y1, Y2, Y3, and also the list of names. And so zip, most of you guys have uh, did your software carpentry training and stuff. You guys know what zip is and such so useful so that way it will let me, I'm basically each one of these is a three element list. And now I'm gonna zip them so that way I have uh, each iteration of the loop, X, Y, and name, and I can then do a plot command for a axis object at a time. Plot X, Y, color, just because I wanna give it a color, and set the, and this is how this may have been the harder part for you guys. Uh, that's okay, but you can blank out the ticks by saying x ticks equals an empty list, y ticks equals an empty list, and then set the title, things like that, and then finally your show. It was that simple. Well, I'm not gonna say simple. I, 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 I admit I do a lot of this uh, in, you know, ableist type language. Uh, I say, oh, it's just that simple. I don't mean it, I'm sorry. I know people at Berkeley are not happy with me. Um, 
Yes, it's it's simple once you understand it. It, I was in your in your in your uh, position one time, and then there you go. You made a wonderful figure. All right. Um, do you guys want to take a quick break? Because the next section is actually rather long. If you want to grab some coffee or something and go to the bathroom or something like that, you can come back if you need to. Uh, just quick five minutes. A really good question that came up that may be confusing some of you. Because chances are you're not perfect like me. Um, you had errors. <laughs> you had an error with your code, and you threw an exception or something partway through. Um, and so then, therefore, a figure never showed. But a figure was created. Then you go back, and you fix your code, and you become perfect like me. And you execute that, and it does create a brand new figure. But the other figure was still in memory. And then when you call plot.show, both figures show up. And you go, oh, what's this other figure here? It came from your previous failed attempt to being perfect. <laughs> but that's all it is. And the next time you run it, it will disappear. And everything will be all hunky-dory. Yes. Hopefully, by this point, even if even many of you who did not really get to be following along with this first uh, notebook, I hope hopefully we got the rest of you up and running. Is, is anybody still not actually able to produce these images the way you're expecting it to? Because if you, if you do, we still have people here who can help you. Okay, because you're at a plotting tutorial, and so not being able to view plots is, well, you, you'll be in for a very boring three hours because I guarantee you the jokes get really flat after this. So we're now, if you go back, so if you can go ahead now and close out that part one notebook and you come back, come back to this uh, list of the available uh, notebooks, you can then go to part two, plotting methods uh, overview. You click on that and a new tab opens up. We're at the visual overview of plotting functions. All right, are we ready? Anyone not ready? See, I, I'm learning something from Chalk Proper Carpentry. Anyone not ready right now? OK. We've talked about uh, how we were laying out those subplots. And we talk, but we, we haven't actually talked much about the plotting itself and what sort of plots. We, we showed an example of a simple line plot. And we showed an ex example of a simple scatter plot. But we never really talked about them. And, the, and I guarantee you, Matplotlib would not be as popular as it is today if those were the only two plotting functions it provided. Although it would still be better than MATLAB. Um, now, we do have documentation on every single, I gotta watch my language, every single uh, plotting function we have. Um, we have, and there's a lot of them, and we have the gallery that covers over uh, most of those, we even have a, a page in our documentation that lists every single plotting function we have and all its different variants and things like that. And it is a giant monstrosity of a page. It's one of those things that just happens when you're plotting like one of the most popular plotting, plotting uh, libraries out there. Uh, because everyone and their mother wants to be able to plot using your library. Um, I'm not going to go over all of them. I'm not even going to provide you a, a link to it because it's just, it'll just scare you. Um, but I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to break them down into categories and talk about some of the main ones, the things that are going to interest 99% of you. Again, you'll see this theme a lot in Matplotlib, that Matplotlib satisfies the needs of 90%, 90, 99% of you, and then for the remaining 10 or 1%, we do not try to prevent you from doing what you're doing. We are not, as we say, stupidly unhelpful. Um, so, so this, is, this tutorial, in general, is going to be more to whet your taste for all this. It's going to whet your appetite. This is going to get you interested in what, wait, if Matplotlib can do this, what else can it do? It's going to help you with that. Hopefully, it'll get you interested in coming on to the mailing list and chatting with us and finding out the th more things that it can do and get you to go to the gallery and explore and discover all the other things that Matplotlib can do. So let's go over the basics. What do most of us have? We have 
1D data, time series, most likely, or some other sort of thing. So we have plot with and without markers. We have scatter. Now, um, something to make very, very clear, and this is a misconception that happens. What is a plot? What is scatter? A lot of people will say, well, scatter is just plot, but without the lines. That is technically incorrect. Um, or more than technically incorrect, it is just wrong. It's just, it is a common misconception. Um, if you want to make a plot of markers just simply without lines, then you can use plot and just say that you don't want a line. Uh, it will be faster, much more efficient, and it will be uh, much more explicit of what it is you want. If what you really want in a situation of where you're plotting markers without lines is that you want to uh, be able to color them based upon some other piece of data, or you want to size them based on some other piece of data. As you will see in this example here, we have a different mark, we have the same marker just at different sizes, or the, the same marker but at different colors, or sometimes both. Uh, that is what scatter does. That is the purpose of scatter, so that you can size or color your markers accordingly to some piece of data. If you don't, if you just simply wanted to put markers down, but without a line, use plot instead. All right. Bar graphs. We have many different kinds of bar graphs. We have bar graphs up the wazoo. You can do so many different things with bar graphs. It's crazy. We have the generic fill. So basically, you specify the outline of a polygon, and everything inside that is automatically colored a certain way. Um, but then you can also do fill between something. Uh, you can do a whole bunch of these special little plots. You can do stack plots and things like that. They're all very pretty, very useful. So that's the 1D type data that most people are typically used to. Uh, my bread and butter is dealing with images. I do a lot of image processing, uh, satellite data, and things like that. So I'm always viewing images. Uh, so we have IM show, where you can pass it some data to show it, you, or you can pass it RGB arrays, red, green, blue channel arrays. So basically, it's a uh, th 3D uh, array. Uh, so M by M by 3. Uh, we'll go into detail later. Uh, but then you can display any image you want. There's P color, which is a more generalized form of IM show. Uh, and you can do various things like that. Uh, again, we'll go into more detail. If you click on any one of these images, you'll see the code that produced these. So, you know, you could download that and you can see how it was that we made it. Uh, contour, so contour will produce just the lines at uh, equal level intervals, uh, or at, uh, at uh, level curves of your 2D data. Uh, contour F will produce the polygons representing the regions in between the level curves. And then if you want to have outlines of those polygons, you'll do two calls. You'll do one to contour, and then you'll do the same call to contour F, and you get that uh, there. And then you can even have uh, contour, level, uh, contour labels available, and that's uh, called C label as well. Um, I don't get into this in the tutorial how to do that, but if you click on this example, you'll see how to use C label and do that funny little stuff. And of course, that's also in the gallery. Uh, any uh, hy hy hydrodynamicists or meteorologists in this room? Uh, yeah, we do vector fields. Uh, I guarantee you about half the core devs in Matplotlib are meteorologists. So because we have majority vote, we put in a bunch of meteorology things too. Um, yay, meteorologists. I, I'm, I'm a meteorologist by training, so um, so we like wind barbs and stream plots and 
things like that. Uh, we, we have arrow, quiver, and stream plot. We also literally have wind barbs. So any meteorologists here who are used to seeing those METAR uh, images and you see that round thing with the barb going on, we actually have some of that. Uh, not in Matplotlib proper, but you can get a, a separate package and uh, have that available uh, for you to use. Um, doing data distributions, so we have histogram functions, we have box plots, we have violin plots, uh, all very useful uh, tools. Uh, the, uh, the estimator type things that are used here, we have some very basic estimators built in, but we can also dip, uh, offload the estimators to some other package as well. Uh, so some people like that. And I had just now noticed yet another bug. Statistical. Uh, when we move it over to Matplotlib, we'll, uh, we'll file a bug report, All right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So again, we'll do the common imports and some of the other common setups that you just don't want to get distracted with. All right, so let's uh, take a look at bar plots. Um, because we, we already did uh, plot and scatter for the moment. Let's uh, take a look at bar. Uh, with bar, uh, so the regular bar command assumes that your bars are straight up and down. Uh, we also have bar H, where it assumes that your bars are horizontal. We also, you can also, uh, we also have a car call signature for the bar function where in which you can literally just pass in lists of length, height, width, and, uh, and uh, what's the B stand for? I can, B, I have no clue what, I, maybe, that, maybe that meant to be depth or something, I don't know. Um, box? Bottom. Bottom. Yes, I didn't come up with these call, call signatures, I, but uh, yeah, length, height, so you can just pass in, and so you can actually create like basically your view of Manhattan if you want. Okay, more like Kansas, but it. Um, so let's just uh, do a very simple example. I'm just gonna create some random data. Uh, uh, create my figure, and my axes, just two. Uh, subplots here, and my fig aspect, I'm going to make this figure uh, two times wider than it is tall. Before, when we did fig, fig aspect two, it was twice as tall as it is high. Now we're going to do the other way around, the inverse. Um, and we're going to, in each one of these, we're going to do a couple of bar plots. Um, I'm also going to take this moment, I'm going to to show off yet another function, axe H line and axe V line. So we're going to do H line for the uh, the first subplot and V line for the uh, second one. Uh, I'll show you in a, in a moment why that's really useful. Let's create that. I I, I just also realized I haven't actually demonstrated the interactive. In, uh, aspect of matplotlib. So I'm going to pan here. So we have ourselves these uh, bar, and we have that axe, uh, the axe uh, H line, so the horizontal line. And why is that really neat? Well, no matter how much I zoom, that line is going to show up. So much better than doing your own little plot from zero to five, because then as you zoom around from left to right, you, you're not seeing the edges. This thing will go on for infinity. It will always be there. So that's a neat, nifty little feature to have available. Uh, we are working on a uh, feature where in which you can do an arbitrary orientation of a line. Uh, some people are working on that. It's a little trickier than we thought, but it'll be a really neat feature. It's uh, very common in ggplot, those are coming from R. Uh, I'm going to pan around here, and that vertical line, again, will go on for infinity. Very useful. But yeah, see the tick labels move as you pan around. 
everything moves around for you. And that's one of the power one of the powerful features of Matplotlib is that this interactivity you get for free. You notice that you didn't have to code up a single thing to make th those tick labels move with you. you. Notice you also didn't have to code up a single thing to come up with those tick labels. Those tick labels were figured out for you automatically. Now you can override them if you want, but that's again, it's about being, not being stupidly unhelpful, is that Matplotlib will not get in your way if you want to do something, but if you don't specify something, it will put in some very decent default values that are a good heuristic of what you want most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. All, all, all the standard GUIs, yes. Now, uh, there is one uh, GUI backend, the QT backend. They actually have an extra button right here. That's because uh, when the person who gifted that backend to us like 10 or so years ago, uh, he added that feature in, but then never did it for the other ones. So one day, we're going to have it across all of them. Uh, there's somebody working on a, a uh, a module for Matplotlib that will make it easy to create cross-platform uh, widgets and things like that. Uh, but we're, we spent the past two years working on the style overhaul, so now we're trying to catch back up with everything. So we'll, we'll have that eventually soon, so those things will be available to everybody and to all backends. So yes. Um, so you also noticed that I that when I called um, the bar. Uh, method on these axes. I sometimes you'll see me capturing the return from that, and sometimes you'll see me just letting it drop. You don't actually need to capture it most of the time. Uh, the only times you need to capture that in, an, in in a variable is if you want to modify the properties after the fact. Uh, that's sometimes useful, uh, but not capturing that we already are holding a reference to it uh, inside uh, the figures and the axes and such. So it's never going to actually get garbage collected until you close out that figure. So you don't have to worry about Python destroying those objects for you inadvertently. It will only destroy them once your figure is closed. So, so you don't have to worry about losing that. But if you want to modify properties, it's perfectly fine to, to capture that thing. So, um, so this so we we have a situation. This is perfectly fine for most people, but what if you wanted those uh, those three bars there to be a different color because they're in the negative area? Now we could have done two separate calls to bar and have one of them be for blue and one of them be for uh, or green and have one of them be for uh, red. But let's just for the sake of demonstrating why one might capture those uh, objects that are returned by those functions, or those methods, let's take a look. I could do that bar right there, and then I can zip over that thing. That uh, b The bar method returns a tu tuple-like object uh, of bar objects. And I'm going to check, okay, I'm going to check what, what the height was for that one. And if it was negative, I'm going to set its edge color to red and salmon because I can and because I like fish. I told you the jokes were going to get worse. And there you go. Now, notice I didn't do that axis H line, so now that axis H line isn't there anymore. So it, you zoom around it. But, but here I just simply showing how to make those, how to make any of those bars that were negative a different color. You know, it's a bit of a contrived example, yes, but that may be a situation why you want to retain these objects and be able to do things with them. The H4, I'm sorry, I, in this case I just did the regular, I just did the first one. So I, I didn't do the second subplot 
in this in this particular case because I was just simply demonstrating it just for this. Yeah. Hmm? Sorry, what was that again? What, this one? Yeah, so the, oh, you can. Thomas, I think we have a bug. Yeah, the edge, that's right. Didn't we run into that bug, Thomas, or there's there some sort of issue with edge colors or something in uh, bar graphs? I guarantee you this did work two years ago. I, yeah. Oh, you saying you might have broke it or? Oh, the edge width. Well, there's line width. Is that? Okay, let's move on. I, th I think I recall something that there was a bug in 2.0 where certain cases uh, the edge color wasn't being set. Again, we're going to get into what some of these things mean in the next section anyway, so let's not get all hung up on that right now. All right, so let's um, take a look at the other type of stuff filled uh, fill be between, which is very useful. So if you're doing, uh, want, want to plot, you're plotting some particular data and then you want to show what the envelope is of that data or whatever, uh, you know, a very common thing that science-y type people I've been told do. Um, but uh, well, we'll get to that error one, uh, the error uh, envelope in a second, but this is just a very nice, simple, uh, you know, fill between, it's, it's going to assume that you want everything to be uh, set to a Y value of zero, so anything below will color upward, anything above it will color downward, but you can actually set that Y to be anywhere you want it to be, so you want it to be 20, you want it to be negative 15, whatever, you can actually set that if you want. Um, now let's take a look at an example where we're, uh, 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 also, yeah, in this case, yeah, so that fill between, that first one we did, uh, the fill between X, Y, uh, we only specified one bound curve, and that was the Y, uh, the Y being that, but if I want to specify another bound, you know, right now it's, def it's assumed to be zero, but, uh, so that's why it's bound there, but then if I want it to be, let's say, something else, that's how you would get an envelope. So that was Y1, and that's Y2. You're able to then bound your, uh, make an envelope like that. You can do more general things if you wanted to. It's all available. All right. And this is the part that Thomas really wants me to highlight for everyone here. This is a brand new feature added in uh, 1.5. It's called the data keyword argument. Um, a lot of these plotting functions that we're going to specify, not every single one of them, but a lot of them, uh, now take on an extra keyword argument. Anyone here not know what keyword? I'm hoping the software carpentry covered what that meant. Is any of those function arguments where you say the name of something equals something else? That's a keyword argument. It's a argument that is keyed by a word. Um, so a lot of times uh, you heard these pandas things. How many people came from the pandas uh, tutorial? Right. So you have this pandas object, and how do you access the individual stuff in there by their name? Kind of like a dictionary, right? Well, if you were to have done those examples using, let's say, a pandas data frame, you would have done data frame square bracket quote x end quote square bracket comma data frame open bracket quote y quote 
and bracket. Uh, that's just so tedious. Um, and again, we want to make things simple for you guys uh, when you're, particularly in an interactive situation where you're typing things at the REPL, and you uh, kind of like how you feel like you're doing in MATLAB. You want to make that simple to use. So let's say we have this data object. I'm not going to create a pandas object. I'm going to make something that is a dictionary. And it's going to have x, y1, y2, mean. It's going to have the things already in it. We're going to pretend that this is a, a, uh, a pandas object. I'm going to create that subplot. I'm going to call up that fill, fill between. I'm going to say fill between x, the string x. Fill between, uh, you know, that's my x. And then I'm going to say y1, y2. Now, notice if I were to just simply have that, just ended it right there, matplotlib will think you're crazy. But I'm passing in as a data argument, I'm passing in the data object through the data keyword. So now, let's say you're at the REPL and you did one plot. Okay, good. You hit back and you're back to that plot. You can then swap out another pandas object that had the same keys in there. You can then do multiple. It makes it really easy to quickly reference things and just swap out different data objects and things like that. It makes things useful for those uh, purposes. But let's uh, take a look at what that makes. Wow, it makes the same exact plot. It's just a slightly different semantics. If you like the other way, that's perfectly fine. If you like this way, that works too. And so a lot of the plotting functions, so bar, plot, scatter, things like they all now support the data keyword argument uh, you can use. All right. Uh, so let's um, do a fun little thing, and we're going to try to use bar and fill between and make a uh, prediction of how snarky you guys are going to get by the end of this class. So let's see if we can reproduce this figure. So I'm going to provide you some data because I already know how snarky you'll get. And don't worry about so much about all this stuff here. Um, and I'll even give you guys the color. You can change the colors if you want. Uh, but I'd like you to try to figure out, okay, how am I going to make these bars, these error bars, and this fill between right here using the data you have. We have five minutes, let's uh, give that a whirl. So obviously the first thing you need to do is create your figure and your axes, and your one axis that we're gonna make. And you know, you're taking a look at that figure. The first thing you want, uh, is that plot of the raw snarkiness data. So that obviously means that you have to do a plot call. And then the next thing you want to do is the bar graph of the raw, of the, uh, of the aggregated the cumulative, I guess, the statistical average of the time lag. I, you know, I'm trying to sound, sound scientific and it's just totally not working. Um, but yes, we're gonna take that raw snarkiness data and we're going to, uh, you know, we, we did that Y average at so many intervals and we said what that width that interval was and we're gonna provide a color and in addition, we're also going to provide the, er the uh, error data. And we're also going to provide the color for some of those things. Why do I? Oh, for those who don't know, e color is how you would specify the color of the error bar. Meanwhile, edge color is the color of the bar, the edge of the bar is, yeah, we'll cover that in the next section, in the uh, next uh, notebook. Um, and then, so that's the first two plot elements that we see up here. We have 
the raw snarkiness data. We have the bar with the error bars. So now the only thing left is that filled region behind all of this. And note, it is behind it. So we're going to uh, provide the uh, envelope data that we have at a fill between call. Can't, there we go. We provide the color, the fill color, and it's going to end up uh, magically behind everything. Uh, this is just simply a fluke of how Matplotlib uh, defines certain things are going to be positioned by default. You can override any of those things. For the most part, the order in which you specify these things will determine which is on top of which. But for some reason, we have fill between, like always behind everything. I, I don't totally understand why, but that's what it's always done. So, um, now we're going to set the title of our figure, the Y label, and the X label, and then we're going to show it, execute it. Ah, a slight oddity for those of you who are running version 2.0. Because of the style changes, one of the default, one of the changes we made to the defaults was where the bar for bar graphs were going to be oriented by default. In the old style, it was or uh, the location you specified was considered the edge of the bar. Now, by default, in 2.0 and later, it's considered to be the center of the bar. But you can override this. So if we want to reproduce what the old graph looked like up here, because maybe your statistical processing already took that into account and already knew all this and whatever, and that you know better than matplotlib, you can override it. We're not going to prevent you. So we go back to bar. We're going to add an argument here. You know why I love being a programmer? Because you get to do a lot of arguments. I, I, I love arguments, yes. Um, align equals edge. Oh, look at that. Now it looks pretty much exactly like the figure that was up above. Everything is oriented the way we want it, and everything is all well with the world. And you guys now know how snarky things are going to get. Hmm? I'm sorry, which, what? For which part? Right here. And then what's the other value it can be? It can be center, right? Edge or center, yeah. So in the past, the default was edge. Now it's center. And if you want to be one way or the other, you can just explicitly state that. And that's what it will be. All right. Wonderful. Now let's. Hmm? P P L D what? Okay, one person what? Oh, P R E D. Oh, the pre uh, the the predicted X, and the predicted Y, and the predicted uh, yeah, the predicted. Yes, I know. Programmers are terrible with their variable names, and um, I actually because I am perfect, I'm going to say this was not my fault, and I actually have proof of this. Someone else wrote this example for me. <laughs> 
it, it, if you look at the GitHub Git history, someone else wrote it. <laughs> All right, so now let's move on to some images. This is a very common thing that many people want. So I am show, P color, P color mesh. Uh, they do slightly different things. Um, one of the key things that's different, so you can use P color to do, like P color you can use it for arbitrary grids so long as they're uh, ordered in an organized fashion, in a somewhat organized fashion so that they're monotonic. Uh, they don't have to be regular, but they still have to be monotonic. Um, so with P color and P color mesh, you can do these arbitrary grids, and so you can do these nice little fancy stuff that you can't quite do with IM show. Uh, but you, if let's say the grid is regular, um, and you wanted to do a P color or P color mesh, there is one very subtle difference between IM show and P color. And that is that the coordinates you specify for I am show refers to the center of the pixel. Meanwhile, for P color, they refer to the edge of the uh, pixels. Um, if you ever talk to uh, image processing people, you can basically split them up into two groups. And those people who think that your coordinates should be the centers and the other people who think that it should be at the corner. And it's like the Crips and the Bloods. I, seriously, if you, if you get the two of them together in, in a bar and you, and you just throw that bomb in there and they start arguing about it, they'll do it for hours. Uh, so I've seen this happen. Don't start such arguments because then you'll be that crazy guy that they, everyone hates. So, but that note that that's a difference. So sometimes people say, this thing is shifted over a little bit. Yes, because the P color refers to your corner. Now when you have a high resolution image, you're not really gonna notice that tiny little shift. But if you have a low resolution image that you're looking at, yeah, you're gonna notice that it's shifted over by half a pixel. Now, uh, one thing that's nice, I am show, you can do uh, image interpolation automatically. That's really nice. They're also very, very fast to, uh, to render. Uh, P color is extremely slow, uh, but you can do arbitrary grids. So, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's uh, pick the uh, graphing uh, method that fits your situation the best. So, but let's uh, talk about what they have in common and that is, uh, and, uh, and that goes back, remember I talked about the difference between plot and scatter, and that scatter, you can size your marker or color your marker according to some piece of data. It's known as a scalar mappable. So there's a, some scalar value that, we would, that we're given, and we use that to determine what the some other property, whether it's a size or a color. Uh, and for the case of the P color and I am show, uh, we're gonna be determining the colors of the pixels. But for scatter, you can do it for size or for color or both if you want. Um, we'll get into a little bit more detail about that in a moment. But let's first talk about one of the most common things you'll see with images and that is the color bar. Um, so let's do a very simple, I'm going to load up some data and I'm going to uh, do an IM show of that data. That data is already a 2D array of values between such and such and such and such. I, I don't remember what it is. Um, and I'm going to pick a color map and just because I'm weird, I'll, I'll just the, the just earth thing. We have a whole bunch of them. We'll cover that soon, what the uh, color maps are. And then I'm going to add a color bar to the figure. And I'm going to say that this color bar is going to be in reference to this scalar mappable, this IM, this uh, image uh, data. So we see the image that has been made nice and pixelated. And there's the color map that it created. If I didn't have that color, 
uh, that, I'm sorry, not color map, the color bar. If I didn't have that there, so I'm going to comment it out. The image is a slightly wider. So what happens when you call fig dot color bar? It's going to steal some space away from the axes that are there, and uh, and use that amount of space. So it will shrink those things down a little bit, and it'll use that space to add in the color bar that's there. Uh, you can explicitly state which axes to steal some space from. It will steal about the same amount from each one. It, it's a bit tricky logic under, underneath, but you don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, you just have to watch out an older, uh, if you have uh, multiple subplots in a row, and then you want one color bar at the very end, if you call fig.colorbar and use that last uh, IM, that last image there for that, it's going to steal space only from that one. So all of a sudden now you have one image that looks smaller than the other two. And that looks a little odd. You can actually then say, hey, I want you to steal space from all three. So it will shrink all three equally so they all look to be the same size and then give that amount of space for the color bar to be added in. Okay. Um, also, you notice that, you know, up until now, you know, most of our uh, plotting calls have been on axe, axe dot IM show, axe dot plot, axe dot scatter, axe dot bar. This one, big dot color bar. That's because this is not an axis method. We're not adding a color bar to an axis, we're adding the color bar to the figure. Again, this is where it's really the object-oriented uh, notation, the object-oriented approach of specifying and saying I want to do this action on this object makes it explicit what it is that you're intending. So it doesn't make sense to add a color bar to an axis. It only makes sense to add it to a figure because it's just simply another element of the figure that goes with the axes, but it's not a part of an axis. It is actually an axis in of itself, but that's an implementation d detail that you don't have to worry about, but <coughs> anyway. Um, there are some things you can do uh, where, where you want it to be positioned um, and how you want it oriented. So here, we do the same sort of example. I want, let's say I want a situation, you know, by, by default, the color bar will always be placed outside of where the axes are. So it gets its own space in the figure. Uh, and that's what most people want most of the time, but come on, we've all seen it. Sometimes you have a color bar that's inside the image in a particular location. You can do that. So you can actually explicitly create your own, what I call a C-ax object. And, you, and again, this is like, this is one of those situations where Matplotlib is not gonna stop you from doing what it is you want, but it's not gonna make it totally easy either. Yes, you have to know exactly how to specify what these axes are, what the, what, what the coordinates are gonna be, things like that. You have to know a little bit about the underlying uh, things about uh, figures and axes, but it allows you to do it. So you specify that, and there that axis is going to be created. I'm going to do my IM show just like I did before. I'm going to call fig.colorbar, pass it my IM object. I'm going to say cx equals cx. So I'm going to tell colorbar, rather than you trying to steal space from these other places, I already made space for you. Use this and you pass in what that is. And then here's another argument, uh, orientation equals horizontal. By default, it's vertical. Here, you can say, hey, I want it to be a horizontal color bar, let's say. And look at that. Pretty, not terrible. You know, if you had done, if let's say we didn't have that horizontal Thing in there. So it's now, it's a very, very wide color bar <laughs> with all of its labels really, really scrunched in there. So yeah, 
we're not going to stop you from doing it, but you can do it. And so the, uh, the, the shape of the color bar was completely determined by the axis that was created. But yeah, it's, it's all right there. All right. Um, in the last uh, notebook, when we get to it, I'm going to cover a module called Axis Grid, uh, actually called Axis Grid 1. Um, it actually, for those who want to do much more advanced type of displaying multiple images and having a color bar, that's, it's a, it has a much more advanced uh, notation for that and very, very useful. We'll get into that. It's neat. Um, so if you feel like, oh man, I mean, I gotta, I gotta you know, describe all this stuff and it's gonna get tedious for me to do this for every single image, stuff like that, no. Axis Grid 1 actually uh, provides a very useful interface for uh, handling uh, much more complicated uh, layouts of uh, images and, color, and their associated color bars. What are some other parameters that these uh, functions uh, share besides just the CMAP? So we, we went over CMAP, We'll cover some, some of the names of them later. B min, B max. So by default, when you pass in the data to these functions, it's going to assume that you want the color bar or the color map to extend over the minimum and the maximum of, of the data that you pass in. It's going to assume that. But you can explicitly say, oh, I don't know, I want the B min to be this and I want the V max to be that. Those are the arguments. And then, uh, you probably won't run into this too often, but you can you can actually pass in your own normalization object. Uh, there's documentation online about describing it, but you can actually then say that no, I want you to do a log norm, or I want you to do a, uh, a sim log, or something. You can specify other log stuff rather than just a simple basic linear uh, log to use to normalize the data to zero to one. So that way we can color map it. Because that's how the color mapping stuff works and the color bar works is that we normalize the data, the scalar value that, of the scalar mappable. We normalize that to zero to one. We then have a color map that operates on values between zero and one. That's all under the hood. You never have to deal with that most of the time, but if you wanted to override some aspect of that, that's how you would do it. Okay. So when would you use vmin and vmax? Those are the ones I tend to use a lot. Uh, let's say you're looking at a series of images. And so uh, those series of images may, you don't know if the minimum and the maximum value are always going to be the same. You can actually explicitly state, I want the minimum and maximum to be this. That way, every single time, the color bar is for the same range. And that you're color mapping it the same way so the same value gets the same color every single time. Very useful. You know, you sometimes will see people make the mistake where they don't specify this, and then therefore they're looking at two different images, and they go, oh, wow, that's a very interesting feature, but no, actually they were both colored incorrectly. They weren't uh, colored in the same way, and so it's actually not really a feature. See an example of that right here. So let's say I have this. Notice I got a red to blue or blue to red uh, color map, but my zero is not on the white. It's slightly in the red. So now my data looks like a slightly biased red. Well, one might make a scientific pronouncement. Oh my gosh, the universe is biased red. No, it's not. You're, you didn't specify your V min and V max. And so therefore, it was not centered. It went to whatever the min and the max of your data was. So how do you fix that? Well, you specify B, B min, B max. You can say that you want B min to be negative 2 and the B max to be 2. Ah, the universe is all perfectly balanced. Yes. Any questions on that respect? This is actually a very common trip up that many people run into is they get confused with their analysis because they didn't color it right. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is an example of it, just a single map, but some, another time that this happens when you have multiple subplots in the same figure, well, 
the, uh, the color map, the color bar is only going to be done to one of those uh, figures, V min and V max, so that it may be confusing for the, with the other one. So if you just explicitly, remember, explicit is better than implicit. You go ahead and you say that you want it to be negative two to two, there will be no confusion whatsoever about what it is you're viewing. All right, uh, let's do, I'm not gonna spend like a million minutes on this, but let's just uh, take a look. I wanna reproduce this figure. I'm gonna give you the data, right? I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this. Uh, again, I randomly generate the data. I'm gonna do uh, classic. One of the big things that changed between version 1.5 and 2.0 is the color map. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we went from Jet to Veritas. Um, and so for the purposes of this example, I wanted to reproduce what the old Jet color map uh, images were. The color map of Jet is that really, really colorful one and it is dangerous to use. Please don't use it. But for the purposes, I just wanted to make something nice and pretty. So uh, going to, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and get this moving along. Solutions. So have that data. Um, well, don't worry so much about what tight layout is. Uh, tight layout, um, I I'll show you an example, a really good example of it later. And there we have the color bar axes that we're making, the special, uh, the special one that we're gonna have. I'm gonna loop over the data that I have and the axes. So I have the tuple, I have the, uh, the list of the axes object. I have data one, data two, data three. And I'm gonna do I am show on each one. I have V min equals zero, V max equals three. And I'm gonna say, yeah, the interpolation can be near. So that's the other thing that changed in 1.5 to 2.0 is that the interpolation uh, will be the nearest one. So that means that there won't be any interpolation. It's just pixelated. And there we have the color bar. And we're going to orient it or horizontal. Really very similar to the other example we had. And there we go. Like so. Wonderful. All right, let's take a quick uh, five minute break and we'll move on to the next section, okay? And if anybody have any questions, I'm here to help you out. We're now in part three, the, the part three notebook. Uh, so pre in the previous two, you learned how Matplotlib organizes its plot making by figures and by axes. You notice I'd never deviated from this from this, there was no other way to do it. It is a very simple conceptual model, figures, axes, all the plotting goes on there. We broke down the components. So you now know that there's X axes, there's a Y axis, there's labels, things like that. We learned how to add multiple axes to a figure and how to use them together. We've learned how to change some of the basic appearances of them. Added, did some plotting, we did some color barring and stuff. We did, we did a lot of wonderful and fantastic things. And you guys should really be off to the races now, making fantastic plots and publishing stuff in nature and boosting my impact factor. Well, why are you guys still here? Because you don't know how to control the plots and figures. You don't know the vocabulary yet of Matplotlib. You know some of the words, you know some of the nouns or things like that, but you don't know the adjectives. You don't know the adverbs of how to actually do things. You saw some random stuff in some of the earlier things, but they probably just don't quite make sense yet. You need to learn how to speak Matplotlib. So the very first thing, and this is the most important thing probably, are the colors, which is funny because I don't really see all the colors very well, but just, so there are the many different ways to specify colors in Matplotlib. Um, first things first, 
Uh, and, and I even provide a link to the documentation for pretty much all the ways you can do it. The first one is you can specify a string with the name of the color. And you saw some of this earlier. And we support the full, what is it, 147 color names from the HTML CSS spec specification, including the fact that any one of those names that say gray, we also accept gray. So if it's light gray, you can do light gray. Also burly wood and chartreuse, whatever, I, don't, I didn't take French, so. Um, you know what, we do not allow that. I think we drew the line right there. <laughs> Uh, if we if we if we allow having the U in the word color, no, uh, we. I think I would just reject that pull request outright, just just because it's. Um, so, and then even some of the very basic colors, we even accept single letter representations of it. So, instead of saying blue, you can say B. Instead of saying green, you can say G. Red R, cyan C. Magenta M, yellow Y, black K. You realize you couldn't use B because B was already taken by blue because blue is all stuck up and thinks he's all colorful and everything. So you got to use blue. And then white being W. So those are the single letter uh, representations that are allowed. And then the full names are that's in the HTML CSS spec are also allowed. And uh, and also, it's not case sensitive. So you can have capitalizations if you want stuff. We don't care. It's all out. So that's the most common way to specify colors pretty much anywhere. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can do a string that has the hex value. That is also perfectly allowed. This is also uh, very common among people who do HTML uh, work and things like that. So if you know uh, what your hex value is, we accept that. You, you pass it in as a string. Um, and then we just recently added to version two uh, a way that, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, characters. You can have the seven and eight character represent the alpha channel if you wanted optionally. Uh, some people like it. Sure, not a problem. 256 shades of gray were much better than the movie. Um, the, you can specify a gray level by pro providing a floating point number, but in quotes. Yeah, I, well, whatever, but uh, so zero, uh, zero would, be, uh, would be black, while one would be white. So anything in between there would be different uh, levels of gray. Also, in some places, you can't do this everywhere, but you can do this in some places. Oh, and, and, yeah, that, uh, that gray representation, you can't do that everywhere, but you can do it in most places. Um, RGBA tuples, there are fewer places you can do that at the high level interface to the, to the uh, the functions and such that you guys would call, but there are places down in the lower levels where this is accepted, and there's a few places in the higher level stuff where this is allowed, where you can specify uh, tuples of RGB, so red, green, or blue, that would be a float, floating point value between zero and one, not zero and 255, it's zero and one, um, and so you can do that. And then the uh, fourth channel being alpha is, again, optional. But it has to be consistent. So if you're passing in, let's say, a list of RGB tuples, I believe they all have to be either three, you know, size three, or all size four uh, to be consistent. Because we cast everything as NumPy arrays. And so if they're, if they're not consistent, then it doesn't work. Um, yeah, and so that, that's. But plot and scatter, you can't do. Uh, 
color the full color spec because it gets confusing about what it is you actually mean but uh, but yeah you, you can do certain things so it's there in some places if you need it. you'll know right away if it doesn't work so and then a brand new thing that was added in 2.0 I like I don't think we actually gave this an official name Tom so um, I'm going to give it an official name now called cycle references so because I said it first, I plant this flag. Cycle references. Um, so you may notice that uh, I haven't demonstrated this yet, but when you call plot uh, multiple times, each time you call plot for a particular uh, subplot, uh, the color is different. That's called the color cycle. It does it automatically if you don't specify a color. Uh, so we have these things called uh, Matplotlib styles that you can load up. There's a default style that pretty much you're going to use 90% of the time. You never have to worry about it. But there's been this growth, this community of people developing all sorts of styles for different things. Um, it become needed that you need to know, you need to be able to set in other parts of your code. You may need to say, I wanted this to be the same color as the first color in the styles color cycle, but you don't know what that color is, or you have to go through this obtuse way of looking it up and finding out what it is. We made this simple in 2.0 so that you can just simply say C0 as a string, as C1. So C0 would be the first color of that color cycle. C1 would be the second color of this color cycle. Whatever the color cycle is, you don't know what it is, you don't care what it is, you just want the first color, the second color, until you can do the first 10 iterations. Most color cycles are only about six or seven anyway, so it doesn't matter that for the most part you don't necessarily need to have the full, be able to reference every single one of them. Um, and so you can go all the way up to C9. I'll show an example of this in a second. So here we're going to, uh, I'm not gonna have you guys spend five minutes on this, I'm just gonna show this. Um, we're just going to do a simple plot where I'm going to do just a linear, a, uh, a square, and then a cubic thing. And each one of them, you'll notice, is a different color. Blue, red, and green, right? I think so. Um, no, I, didn't, I didn't say what color they should be. That's the default color cycle. So let's see something. See one, C2, C5, just because I want to be weird. Look at that. They're different now. Red, green, and is that salmon? <laughs> So, um, so you see how that worked. And let's say, let's change that to 0 0.4. That's going to give me some gray color, right? There you go, it's gray. Uh, let's do over here R. That's right, it was already going to be red, right? Uh, make this uh, yellow. Or no, 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 this is light gray. See, now it's light gray, and then to show the other light gray. It's the same thing. It works. Don't worry so much about the T's. It's just simply I'm just providing just a quick set of data so that way you see three lines. No, no, I understand. Uh, so the way the syntax is, the is uh, yeah, okay. Um, you're not from MATLAB, are you? No, I'm sure. <laughs> this is a Mat MATLABism. Um, I could have just as easily have done this.
That is equivalent. Uh, the next parameter, not the last, the next parameter. Yeah, I, I, we have to be very specific here. And also, as you'll learn, it is actually not just color. It's actually something a little bit more complicated than that. Oh, it gets fun. And all this, you can blame this all on MATLAB. This is all due to MATLAB. But this is actually one of the things I... I hate and love MATLAB for it because it does provide a very concise syntax for specifying some very complicated things, but also as a programmer, I effing hate this. This is why we can't have nice things, okay? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, and uh, PyCharm hates us too. PyCharm uh, and IDE hates us because they can't introspect our functions properly to find out what the call signature is and stuff because we have to do all sorts of funky stuff to this call signature in order to make things work. So, and yes, our number one rule is act a lot like MATLAB because that was the original design, but then on top of that, our second rule is don't break backwards compatibility. So all the stupid decisions that MATLAB made, we're stuck with. <laughs> so. You don't need to know this. This is actually don't, it's not required. This is just simply syntactic sugar. You don't have to do it this way. All right? You can actually, and I will show this, you can actually specify, you can say color equals, marker equals, line style equals. You can say all that and you can be absolutely clear exactly what you mean and that is also 100% allowed. All right? But this, uh, syntax that I'm going to be teaching you guys is a shorthand way of specifying this information that is actually very useful at times. And it's also good to know because you'll see other people do it when you come across their code and you want to understand what it is they're doing. So that's colors. Now, how do you specify markers? We have a very robust uh, set of things for specify markers. This is actually a bit of an overkill. For example, four, five, six, seven. Um, that carrot left, carrot right, carrot up, carrot down, that actually really never was meant to be markers. They were meant to be actually something dealing with ticks and stuff like that. And so those were just simply enums for us. But since they all actually fall into that, you actually can use these. Um, so whatever. But the ones that you typically will use are the string values. Uh, so a period is a point, uh, and, actually, and that's actually different than a comma, which is a pixel. We actually have code that actually will differentiate and will do, draw a dot of a certain point size, but then we can actually draw a pixel. Whatever, someone, someone added that code in and we accepted it, okay. Uh, D for diamond, but then, uh, for like the small diamond, but then a, a big uppercase D for the big, you know, bigger diamond, that makes sense. Um, an octagon is a string eight, a lowercase O is a circle, uh, P for pentagon because why not? A, Five, I don't know. Um, yeah, some of these decisions didn't quite make sense. Uh, we have two different hexagons. Uh, the difference is with how they're oriented. Uh, star gets you a star, and X gets you an X. Uh, plus sign gets you a plus sign. So all these things are available uh, to use. So. Uh, don't have to actually understand how this particular code is going to run, but this thing actually will show you what each one of these things look like. So, is the yes, these are all the. Uh, the oh, um, it is cycling. Yes, you're, I think you're right. It's, it's cycling a little bit. I think. Um, Oh yeah. Oh no, no, it's not. It's not cycling. 
Oh, it is. Okay, yes, it is cycling. Uh, but yeah, if you wanted to change it all, I could say color equals red. There you go, they're all red. So that's what they all look like as a marker, nice and large. So all useful to know. So let's, uh, again, you know, we're, you know, similar sort of an example. Let's, and again, for the interest of time, we'll just kind of step through this. But you can play around with this yourself. So now I'm going to start doing that lovely MATLAB stuff, and I'm going to start combining marker specification and color specification. So the marker comes first. So I say star Y, so I'm going to get a yellow star for the linear part, and then for the, uh, the squared part, I'm going to have a, uh, a uh, yes, uh, octagon, uh, magenta, thank you. I'm trying to remember the color name. Magenta. And then for the cubic uh, line, I'm going to have a, a green square. And there you go. So green squares, magenta, uh, octagons. They may, they, they may look rather round because they're that small, but when they get bigger, they actually look more octagonish. And all that. Hmm? Yeah. So the first one was a yellow star, so that's a that's an asterisk Y. And then this one was a magenta oxagon, that's an eight M. And then this one here is a green square, so that's an S G. Now, the last thing that you can specify for these plots are the line styles. So you can do a dash for solid, two dashes for a dashed line. You can do a dash dot for a dash dotted line. Uh, you can do a colon for just simply a dotted line. And then there are three different ways to say nothing. Now, no, this is just a string none. The Python object none actually does not draw nothing. It actually means the default. <laughs> so it will refer back to whatever it would be if you didn't specify it at all. So if you want to say, don't draw a marker at all, you actually pass in a string that is empty or a space or something like that. That, that indicates nothingness. Uh, one note, is, as we get into these format specifiers, um, and I, you know, I do this all the time, doing a dash dot line is a dash then a dot. It's not dot then dash, because what that means is that you want a solid line of dot markers. So, yeah. So here, we do this, ex just this quick example, First one's going to be a solid line. Next one's going to be a dashed line. And the next one is going to be a dash dot. Oh, and then heck, we'll do a quad, uh, do another linear one. It'll be dotted. There you go. So there's four lines here. Look like that. Um, an oddity, and we fixed this, but it's not in any of the current releases yet. Uh, that you see these names of uh, solid dash dash dot dotted. Those names are valid names to use to specify the lines around polygons, so the outline of a polygon. But you can't use those shorthand notations. And then wherever you you can use the shorthand notation, you can't use the worded ones. We fix it for 2.1, but 2.1 hasn't been released yet. Uh, so, but for now, just remember, whenever you're talking about polygons and you want to specify what the, how the outline style should be, the edge line, 
you have to use the word. So, yeah. It's an oddity, but in 2.1, you can go back and forth between the two conventions, and that's perfectly allowed. All right. So, sh quickly, sh uh, now we're going to what was this? show off. Oh, right. Yeah, so this is showing, this is an example. So, polygon, so axe.bar is a polygon that ends up getting made. You have, for so the line style, ls, line style, uh, you have to say dash. So this is just demonstrating that. So now you have dash lines around your bars. In case you ever wanted that to happen, you know, if that's a feature that you wanted deep in your heart, that your bars must be dashed. We, like I said, Matplotlib will let you do it. We're, we, we are not the arbiters of what is ugly and what is pretty. You know, you know what? I say that's a very pretty bar plot. Um, so let's uh, kind of do a little bit of, uh, uh, there's other attributes. So we talked about color, we talked about marker, and we talked about um, the line style, but there's other attributes that pretty much all artists, and these are called artists because they're, they can draw. Anything that you can view on your plot is an artist. Um, we have these Things, and they also have additional properties. Um, I do not. Oh, uh, this 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 cell must have gotten misplaced. But uh, just bringing it all together, so I have a red dashed line, uh, a blue, or a, um, yeah, blue squares, and uh, green triangles. So I'm com combining together some of these different elements so that I can uh, specify them in a shorthand notation. And I can create plots like this. So yes, that's what comes from MATLAB, is this monstrosity of a shorthand notation for specifying it. I could have just as easily had three plot commands, and each one of them saying color equals R, color equal B, color equal G, and then each one of them be marker equal, uh, line style equals dash dash, marker equals S, marker equals, you know, caret. I could have done that, but that would have been tedious and a lot of typing and stuff. And, you know, quite honestly, I'm lazy. Um, and, you know, it's a marker of a good programmer to be extremely lazy. So, yes. Don't let anyone tell you that a programmer is hard, a good programmer is hardworking. He's not. All right, um, so there's a whole bunch of other properties that can be set. Uh, so color or C, so you'll see some, some of these properties have shorthand names that are also available. Uh, the alpha uh, takes a floating point value from zero to one uh, to indicate how transparent is it. Uh, don't worry so much about dash and uh, the dash cap dial and jet joint dial, but if you ever really wanted to deal with that sort of stuff, it's available. Uh, you, you can actually, so those dashes that we specified, the dotted and the, those are actually the pre-made ones that are available. You can, if you really wanted to, come up with your own dash specifications. And so it is a sequence of, uh, there's documentation on it. I, I, I've never actually done it myself, but you can actually specify exactly how you want those things to be. There's draw style. So, uh, by default, the draw of a line will go shortest path between two vertices, uh, but you can do different draw styles so that, let's say, it will take a Manhattan path uh, approach to getting to two vertices or something like that, um, or whether, let's say, it will uh, go up, then over, or over, then up, or over partway, then up, then over, those are different draw styles that are available. Um, so that's the step, step pre, step mid, step post. It all came from people doing finance type work. So you know, you know that the value is going to be the same for a particular quant, uh, quanta and then move on. And, and yeah. Um, line styles, we went over some of those. Line width, uh, so how, 
how wide is it going to be, the marker style, the edge color of the marker, or MEC, the mech, the marker edge width, so how wide the edge, the outline is, yeah, it's complicated. So mu, MFC, MS, the marker size, uh, again, cap dials and joint dials for uh, lines themselves, whether or not it's visible, and the Z order. Z order is actually very important and something you may come across oftentimes. So before I made the comment about that fill between always showed up behind everything, what if you didn't want it to show up behind things? What if you wanted it to be up front? You can set a Z order of that particular object and say, I want you to be a Z order of five or 20 or something. The larger the value, the more in front it will be. And so that way, uh, you can actually control how these uh, artists of these complicated plots are uh, composed. There's a default values that are there, and usually it matters by just simply what order you call them in. There's a couple of them have special values, but that's usually it. But you can also specify your own Z order value anytime you want. All right. Um, let's, do, let's do this. Let's, do, let's make this a real quick example, but I want you guys to actually try this out. I want you to make a plot that has a dotted red line Yard, large yellow diamond markers and that those, uh, those diamond markers have green edges. All right, let's uh, take five minutes for that and uh, we'll, uh, we'll then move on to the next one. So I'm hearing a lot of chatter and I'm not quite sure if that means you guys are all bored with me now or that you're really excited and really finally, you know, really figuring this out and you're cracking it and all. Um, I, I see a lot of light bulbs, but I'm not entirely certain. If, are they all lit up or something? Or, I'm not. Okay. So uh, we'll take a look at the solution here. Involves, you know, just this, the plot itself is very simple. T, A, it's just a question of what are they going to be colored and what the styling and stuff. So, Again, we could have explicitly stated that the color was red and say that the line style equals colon and that the marker equals D. We could have done that, but let's use the shorthand notation here. R colon D. Red, it's going to be red color. Note that it's the red color is one of those weird things. So you have color, you have line color, and you have marker colors. Color, just simply take care of both line color and uh, and marker color, edge colors, all the, you know, if you don't specify those other things, it assumes whatever the color is. Um, but then if you say, but then you can override that in a moment and you'll see. So I want red dotted line with diamond markers. All right, but remember I said that I wanted uh, yellow diamond markers. So you're going to have to say that the marker base color, because uh, you could say marker color, but remember I said I wanted the uh, have green edges. So the face of the marker is going to be yellow, and that the edge color of the marker is going to be green. Did that make sense to anybody, or is that just completely, utterly obtuse? It's okay to say that it's obtuse because I blame MATLAB. I mean, even the shorthand notation of MFC and MEC, and stuff, that all came from MATLAB. We can totally blame them on this, but it is a shorthand notation and it is a consistent one. And indeed, you get a red line, a red dotted line with yellow markers with green outlines. All right. All right. Let's uh, move on from that 1D data stuff and let's come on over to the area that I love, images, and in particular, the color maps. And this is a very, very important topic in uh, scientific uh, visualization, is that you, when you plot a map, uh, an image, 
you could you could just make it black and white. It's just a grayscale thing and just call it done. But you know, oddly enough, the human brain hates that. And so we like to make them colorful to help convey a little bit extra information, things like this. Um, and that's why, but then it's important to select a color map that is useful and not misleading to the, the eye so that we don't see patterns there that aren't intended to be there. That was the problem with the old color map, JET. And JET, I can't even blame this on MATLAB because JET actually predates MATLAB. Um, sure, sure. MATLAB probably popularized it, but it did exist before MATLAB. Um, yeah, there were other packages that were using JET, or if it wasn't JET, it would look very, very similar to JET. Uh, JET goes from blue to red, but it goes through greens and yellows and oranges and stuff. It basically, you, you know, you know that co that comic family circus, where and they and they do that co comic series where they show the kid running around the the, the neighborhood and takes all this weird path and going back. That's JET. All right. Don't use JET because it will actually cause you to see patterns in your data that actually aren't there. Um, there was a fantastic presentation done a couple years ago, a SciPy 2015, I think. Uh, I have a link right here by uh, Nathaniel Smith and Stefan Van der Welt, who uh, developed what are called perceptually uniform color maps. And so basically, you don't see gradients. It is uniformly uh, varying in color space. It's a complicated thing. It's a very accessible, easy to understand presentation. It makes it oh so obvious to go, why the heck have we been doing this the wrong way for so long? Um, even MATLAB actually learned the error of its ways. And a few years ago, they switched over their default color map uh, from JET to Perula. And they said, hey, look, this is a perceptually uniform color map. Everyone should use this. Let's get all on the bandwagon. Um, Nathaniel Smith and Stefan Van der Waal, uh, they actually did an analysis. We actually originally asked MATLAB, if we, uh, the, the math work people, if we would be allowed to include Perula into uh, Matplotlib, a package in Matplotlib, make it available. We, we, we weren't deciding that we wanted it to be default, but we wanted to make it available. MathWorks math said, uh, uh, you're not using our intellectual property and stuff. This stuff is really awesome sauce and all this other thing. Nathaniel Smith actually did an analysis of Perula. It is not perceptually uniform. It's only uniform if you consider it strictly in RGB space. But our eyes actually don't see things in RGB. It sees things in this other weird, complicated color space and such. And so you actually do see gradients in Perula that aren't actually there. Veritas is a lot closer to what the eye, what the human eye actually sees, and it uh, makes things look much more correct. And that is now the new default in version 2.0 of Mat Matplotlib. And you know what, MATLAB, they actually people have actually added a package to MATLAB so that you can load up Veritas, but nobody bothered to make a package to load up Perula. That too, but there are people who don't care about the lawyers and they still don't care enough to get Perula into Matplotlib. So just, say, just saying, just how awesome uh, Veritas is. There's also Plasma, um, Magma, a few others. We'll show them in a second. So this command, this cell that I just ran, it generates all the ones that are built into uh, Matplotlib by default. You can actually create additional uh, ones if you wanted to. Uh, but Veritas here is the very first one. Very pretty. Magma, uh, Plasma was the runner up. Inferno and Magma are the other two. They're all perceptually uniform and they're all very nice in their own way. We just like Veritas because it's green. Uh, it turns out Veritas, what is it? Is it uh, Greek or Latin for green or something like that? or? Yeah. I, I, yeah. So, yeah. 
And anybody who likes Star obscure Star Trek references, it's green. So, uh, sequential color maps. Uh, these are all very nice. Uh, the grays. Uh, this is actually one of the places where you can't do gray with an E and gray with an A. Sorry, I, I didn't bother implementing that. Um, but, you know, very nice and simple. But these go from light to dark in a particular color uh, in a bunch of different ways. Uh, the naming is a little bit complicated. So B U P U. Um, I think that's like blue to copper or something like that, or I, I don't know. Um, and then there's another set of sequential color maps. These are just basically things that go from typically zero to one or zero to a hundred or zero, you know, just things that are just very simple one-sided distribution type uh, data. Um, things that are diverging, so things that are typically like errors. So are you over, under a particular value? They typically go red to green or red to blue. Oh, that's one of the other things that we were watching out for when we created this new color map, is that we were very keenly aware of people with uh, color blindness. So we avoided uh, color maps that had reds and greens together in them. So we would instead opt for blues instead or didn't quite go into the reds or things like that if we had the green. So we try to uh, be fair to that. It also makes things a little bit better for just simply making a grayscale image of a particular color map that makes it look a little bit more normal. Um, but these are all uh, different uh, color maps are all available. Uh, qualitative ones, these are the ones, I don't like the name qualitative, I, I like categorical better. Uh, so if you have, let's say, land cover data, things like that, it's not so much, you don't, you're not worried about gradients, you're not worried about what the value is in between, they're just simply quantized values, and you want them to be this color, this color, this color, and you want them to be distinct from each other. There's a bunch of color maps that are available. And again, remember, you can make a whole bunch of color maps as, uh, for yourself as well. Uh, you don't have to use the ones that are here. Um, and then there's a bunch of miscellaneous ones. Flag, I, this one I do blame MATLAB for. So if you're French, you're Russian, you're American, the flag works great for you, just depending on where in the cycle you're in. It, <laughs> um, Prism, it, it, it just a bastardization of jet, really. It's um, ocean, oddly enough, looks very much kind of sort of like Perula, but it's not. It's really weird. Uh, again, these are just miscellaneous. They're not necessarily bad or anything like that. Uh, G the GIST uh, NCAR, that's the one um, that we use uh, for radar images. So for the meteorologists among us, that's typically the one used for radar images. Um, it's a terrible, utterly horrible color map. So I keep it down here at the very bottom. Um, like you'll see like it's dark and then it gets like light there and then all of a sudden dark again. And then it's light and then dark and then like, it, it's the stupidest color map. But, <laughs> but you wanna know where it came from? The FAA. I blame FAA on this one because it, where you can fly it was marked green. Where you had to watch out for in flying your plane was where marked yellow. And then where you shouldn't put your plane ever was where <laughs> marked red. And then they decided to make a color map out of that. So I blame the FAA on that. So, and so you can specify the color map by uh, string name. And so it's just to do, let's take the same data here, just again, random data and I'm gonna display them as an image uh, doing the gray and doing cool warm. Wait, that gray with an A. I guess we do accept both forms of gray. Oh, no, 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 right there, yeah. Gray right there. Yeah, I never remember which one. Okay, yeah, so we have grays with an S. What the, I just now noticed this. <laughs> we have a gray with an S, but it has an E there, and then we have gray without an S, but with an A. What? <laughs> Okay, I, I, I gotta talk to somebody about this, that one. That, that's... Tom, I think we have a bug. 
All right, so, you know, it's the same data, but with two different color maps applied to it. That's all. And so it just makes everything look different based on which color map you're using. And so that's why it's important to pick a good color map and more importantly to not pick a bad one because it can impact your results. And one of the things you'll see in that presentation by Nathaniel Smith is that it will point out that there was actually a study done where uh, medical images, brain scan images, I think it was brain scan images or something like that, um, when done in jet uh, color map, the uh, lab technician had an increased rate of misdiagnoses than if it was just simply grayscale. And so the conclusion is jet color map can kill you. <laughs> All right, oh, latex users, or those who like to call it LaTeX, I honestly don't care which way you call it, but, so matplotlib, again, being a library used by scientists, and scientists loves using LaTeX, because um, it's better than using Microsoft Word, seriously. Um, we provide a way to do we actually provide two layers of something. So you can actually have matplotlib call out to LaTeX to generate any text object and we then bring it back and we then emb automatically embed it. You don't have to worry about it. All you have to do is have LaTeX installed. But for those of you who don't want to bother trying to get LaTeX installed and just simply want the really, really basic things that LaTeX provides, uh, you can do what we call math text, which is our own built-in home version of the most common things that we find people doing in LaTeX, in particular the math type operations, so the fractions and the, uh, the sub, you know, subscripts and superscripts and the Greek letters and things like that. That way you don't need to actually have LaTeX installed on your computer, we can actually managed to, for the most part, make things look like if it was done using LaTeX. Um, we're not perfect. We don't have ligatures and stuff like that, but it looks pretty decent. So how we do this. Um, basically, if you have basically anything inside a set of dollar signs, if you specify that as a, lot, as, as a math text string, which oddly enough, that's what you do in LaTeX, right, you have the dollar sign, so you have that inline mode of the uh, math text. You, we then parse that out and interpret that. So here we have backslash sigma underscore i equals 15. So it should be the sigma, the Greek character sigma, with an i as a subscript, and then equal 15. Um, and that's going to be in the title. Look at that. You didn't have to call LaTeX. You didn't have to do any of this stuff. I didn't have to have LaTeX installed. I do have it installed on my machine because I am a good little scientist, but um, it didn't need to call anything out. Um, we can if we wanted to, but we don't have to. But then that will work just fine. Um, notice the use of an R right here. What this means in Python, I don't know if they went over this in the software carpentry. Um, what that means is treat this as a raw string. And so you guys know the backslash N, the backslash R, the backslash, these are escape characters to mean new line and return. These are the special characters and stuff. In Python, when you make a string with that, it will automatically interpret that to mean a new line and things like that, but not if you do an R. So if you do an R, it will treat everything as the raw string and therefore it will not turn, let's say you're doing the Greek letter nu and you have a backslash nu. If you didn't have the R there, you would have a, you would have a, a text that would be just a U that seems to be a little bit lower than it should be. And actually, I think in 3.6, they now disallow unknown escape character sequences now. So, so backslash. So, 
Oh, just a warning at this point. Yeah, so in the future, what's going to happen, so backslash s isn't a, I don't think that's a real escape sequence. It used to be in Python, they would just silently just allow that. It didn't escape anything, it was just there. In future Pythons, like 3.7 or 8 or whatever, uh, they're going to actually make that an error because that's just not valid sequence at all. So get used to doing the, the R and you won't have that issue at all. How do you make it what? How do you use actual? Uh, there's, yeah. So you will say use tech equals true. We'll try this. I haven't actually ran my LaTeX in like five years, so we'll see. Okay, it probably did not work uh, because my LaTeX is probably ancient or just not working anymore. And so it apparently silently failed. Hmm? Yeah, it, it's. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I think we have a bug. If it didn't error out for me, it just, yeah. We'll have to look into that. Okay. Well, standard out, it should just go down to right below, so. Yeah. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, now, the next thing. So, uh, when you have polygons, things like that, so the bar graphs, um, the, co the filled contours, things like that. Um, this is actually something that I very much care about because a lot of times I find myself uh, doing publications uh, in papers, uh, doing papers for publications that are black and white only. And so, therefore, your very pretty colored uh, bars, graphs, and stuff are completely useless because they all look dark. And so, you got like three different categories and stuff, and you can't distinguish them. Hatches are to the rescue for this. Uh, unless you really want to do like different scales of gray, but you know, I, I, I kind of like hatches. Um, so these are the different ways you could specify hatches. So forward slashes, backslashes. Uh, again, remember when you're backslashing, you're actually escaping. So you got to escape the backslash or do an R. So uh, make it a raw string. Vertical bars, horizontal bars, cross. cross. And get what? You can combine these. You can make any sequence of them you want. And if you repeat one of those uh, things, it will actually make it more dense. You go, what the heck is he talking about? You'll see in a second. I'll show you an example in a, in a moment, because I'm going to kill two birds with one stone in the next example. All right, so the next thing, so I've talked about color uh, cycles. This came from MATLAB, probably came from other software before this. Uh, but the one thing that always bugged me was that it was only colors that you could cycle. And the way the cycling worked was that if you didn't specify a, a color, it would pick the next one in the cycle. And there was, an, there was a, just an internal cycle that was just held in memory. And it goes, OK, this, this person just did a plot command, but it didn't specify the color. OK, the next one's green. OK, this person just did a plot command, but he said it wants to be black. I'm going to make it black and leave the cycle alone. But it wasn't extended to anything else besides that. It was just color. So you couldn't cycle hatches. You couldn't cycle line styles. You couldn't, because line styles are very, very useful in black and white publications because it's very hard to tell what color those thin lines are, but it's easier to see dashed and dotted and, and tell the difference between them. So why not do general cycling of different kinds of properties. And so for version 1.5, yours truly, uh, implemented property cycling, uh, which is a generalization of color cycling. And so we deprecated colors, just pure co color cycling, and we have it implemented as a property cycle. And so the default style still cycles just color, but you can add other pro properties to it to cycle if you wanted to. You're probably still wondering what the heck I'm talking about, but this is uh, really not that complicated, uh, I hope. So here, I'm, uh, we, we, as different versions of Matplotlib have been released since 1.5.0, we've made slight improvements to how the property cycle 
can be specified and the different places you can specify it. Um, this is one way you can do it. There's a few other different ways to do it. But what you do is you create these cycler objects and you can compose them. And in this case, I'm just simply basically zipping them up. I'm just creating three properties to cycle through. So I want uh, red lines that are width of one that are solid. I want green lines that are width of four that are uh, dash dotted. And I want cyan lines that are width six that are going to be dotted. So each, I just added those three cyclers together and made a property cycle out of that. Um, oh, an odd little thing, and this is something Thomas wants me to tell you. It, Th Thomas, you've been doing Matplotlib now for, what, seven or eight years, something like that. Just today, Thomas learned this. He never knew this existed. Um, this just goes to show you that and, I, and you know, every single time I go back over to this tutorial, I learn something new as I make improvements and stuff to it. And I've been doing this tutorial like now for like four years now. Um, Matplotlib is just that awesome that you just, every single time you go back to it, you find something new. That, and so it just kind of helps keep, keep learning Matplotlib all the time because it's just that interesting and uh, that fresh, if you will. Or you can take the negative view of it and go, it's so freaking big. So, but I like to be optimistic and stuff. It's, it's always fresh. It's a new thing to learn every time. So anyway, so we're going to add a property cycle that's going to cycle not just color, red, green, and cyan, but it's going to cycle three different line widths and cycle three different line styles. And I'm going to do, and I'm going to do the nice, simple, easy to read plotting command rather than the more obtuse uh, MATLAB style. I'm going to call plot three times and you'll see exactly what I mean. Look at that. We just now cycled three different things. And so you can choose what properties you want to cycle. So let's say you don't want to cycle color at all. You know, you, it's strictly going to be a black and white publication. And so you need this thing to look very distinct and you just want them all dark. That's okay. That works. They're all, uh, I think that's all blue. It's black. Yeah, okay, that's right. We, we fell back to black. It used to be blue, but now it's black. So, so yeah. You can, you can do a bunch of different properties. Um, now, this is where I kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to show you guys hatching at the same time, show you guys uh, property cycling. So I'm going to have, I'm going to do uh, fills. And I'm going to cycle between red, orange, cyan, and yellow. And I'm going to do these uh, four different hatch combinations. So here I have just X. Here I have XX dash. So I'm going to have a dense X as well as uh, horizontal lines. I'm going to have uh, crosses with O's and dots. And then I'm also going to have just star. And uh, let's make some ugly ties. They look better than what my kids gave me for Father's Day. So, <laughs> But yeah, you can, so see that star one? Let's double up. Let's do three stars because I'm, it's just so awesome. It actually makes it more dense. So that's the way how hatching is implemented. And then the other slightly odd thing about hatching is I'm going to zoom in here. You can't actually zoom into hatching. Hatching actually keeps looking the same. This is something that actually confuses a lot of people and then it actually caused a lot of confusion because one of the other things we did with updating um, between 1.5 and 2.0 and the style changes, we also increased the, uh, the resolution of the def default resolution of images. So that meant that the hatching actually looked more dense because the resolution increased and so it caused some confusion there. Um, sorry, <laughs> but you know, that's progress for you. All right. Cool, cool. We are on track. All right. Um, 
so this next thing I'm going to talk about. Does anyone have any questions about what we've talked about so far? Because it's a lot of stuff to digest. Um, you guys want a break? We can do a break, sure. All right. I'm not going to demonstrate anything here about the topic of transforms, but because most of the time, and when I say most of the time, I'm talking about 99.9999% of the time, you're not going to have to worry about this. But for those who have been curious, you may have noticed how uh, things have been, uh, it behaves, Oh yeah, that's the other fun thing with, with, with hatches is that as you move around, the hatches don't move. It's a fun little thing. Um, the, you notice, you know, the, the ticks automatically move, the tick labels move as, as I pan and zoom and stuff. And you might be curious, well, wait, how does that work? And it's all through the transform system. Uh, and so we have this transform system where we have different levels of transforms from figure all the way down to data. So figure, axes, well actually display, figure, axes, um, and then uh, data, space. And so, and these transforms are composable. And you never really have to worry about it, but they're also uh, separable as well. So. You may say that, okay, this particular thing is going to be specified in the data space for the x direction, but it's going to be in the figure space in the y direction um, or something like that. And so that way you can kind of pin things to particular areas. So, for example, as I was doing this panning, it's moving things in the data space. Meanwhile, these axis spines are not defined in data space. They're defined in figure space. So I can go ahead and move this thing around all I want. It's never going to move those spines because they're not defined in data space. But meanwhile, the, uh, these uh, tick labels, at least the ones on the x direction, they're defined in the data space for the x direction, but they're defined in the figure space or actually, uh, yeah, the figure space for the, the y direction. So it's separable in that sense. And so the transforms are all combined and come together like that, all under the hood for you guys automatically. This is the magic of matplotlib, that all these things all oriented that way. And that's how you have all this wonderful or, uh, interactivity without you ever having to worry about what any of this does. So if you add a tick label here and a tick label there, they're going to be exactly where you expect them to be after all this interactivity and you're moving things around and you're zooming and panning. And e even if you set your own limits, limits and stuff like that, you don't have to write up one bit of code to respond to any of that. You just say, I want the thing to be here and it will work. And that's basically what, uh, what the transform system is. I go into a little bit more detail about it. And there's also a fantastic um, documentation for those who do want to do some more advanced things. Uh, you can do a nifty thing where you can say, you can actually make a transform on top of an existing transform where you say, I want this thing to be offset by, uh, let's say, seven points or you know, so many inches or something like that. You, so wherever it is, I want to make a shadow behind it. Let's say you can do these sort of effects using transforms. Uh, it's a neat little thing to do, because then that way you don't need to actually know what the coordinate values are of the thing you're making. You're just simply having a copy of it slightly offset or some other thing. The transform system is also how we can have log scales, polar projections, we can do other sort of fancy tricks and such like that. Um, we'll later talk about uh, a couple of packages, one called Basemap, the other one called Cartapi. Um, Carta Basemap is an older map plot plotting library. It did not take advantage of the transform system. It's going to die. I'm speaking, I'm saying this as the package maintainer. 
I'm killing off base map because it's not using the transform system. Cartopi, a newer thing that also does map plotting, it does use the transform system. So you can do all sorts of wonderful interactions with your uh, transform, with your plots and things like that. And you can zoom things and things behave the way you expect it to. Base map, it doesn't behave because we didn't use the transform system. So if you fight against the machine, the machine will eat you. And, that, and that's what's going to end up happening. And uh, now you know where this magic comes from. It's come from the transform system. And so if you want to learn more about it, it exists. And it's perfectly usable to, to use if you want to. Other things I've been talking about. So you may have met, may have heard me mention times that, oh, by default, it uses the solid line style. Or by default, the color is blue. Or by default, this happens or that happens. The matplotlibrc uh, file is the default system. And so anytime you don't specify something, it will go and check the RC file to see if there is a default value to use uh, that makes sense and will use that. So anytime that you say none, the Python object none, it means go and check the RC file. Or if you don't specify it at all, that's the same thing as saying none. Um, and so what this has allowed us to have happen are multiple styles. Uh, anyone here heard of Seaborn, the Seaborn package? OK, so Seaborn, they provide the Seaborn styles. And so that's just simply a RC file that, uh, that it loads up it over on top of the defaults that matplotlib has so that it can uh, make its plot look the way it wants. There's another package that used to exist called pretty, pot, pretty plot lib, uh, I guess because they thought that our, our plots weren't pretty. Again, like I said, I, you know, aesthetics are completely arbitrary. And, but, um, but no, it, some people like th their things look different. We have styles uh, that are good for people doing black and white publications. So therefore, the uh, color, uh, the property cycle is in there to change the line style instead of changing color because it's black and white style. Um, you have a bunch of different styles like that, and it's all done through the mat matplotlib RC file. So um, we have the default built-in uh, style, we, but then you can also specify your own. And so if you want to know where your own RC file is, you can run this little thing, and it will tell you where it's loading up uh, your RC file. So here. This file here, I can go and edit that if I wanted to, and I can make changes to what would be the default, uh, our, the default style of all my plots every single time I load things up. This is also the place you go if you want to specify a default backend or if you want to specify some other things that aren't really style related, but maybe uh, uh, let's say one thing that you can do. Uh, for those who are doing animations, you want to specify the default encoder to use for animations. You can go into this RC file and, and uh, edit it there. That way, Matplotlib knows where to uh, where to use to generate a uh, MPEG or whatever. So, all right. Um, there's a, a few different ways that you. So the the file, and that's what gets loaded up by default. And you can even then tell it to use a, another uh, file within your own code. We also have a few things where you can actually edit individual values. And you also have a uh, function for reverting back to defaults. So we have MPL RC defaults. What that will do is that it will revert everything back to the built-in defaults, which is useful for a variety of different things. Um, and then here is how you can edit some of those entries in the RC. Uh, this, so for lines.line width and lines.line style, I can set these two values like so. These, uh, these two commented out lines, they're equivalent to this line up here. So. You see this pattern in Matplotlib all the time, is that we provide old ways of doing things, 
that may be one way. But we also provide other more concise ways that may not be as flexible, but they're concise. So we provide both of them. They're both perfectly valid to use. So here I want uh, some thicker line width than usual, and I want them to be uh, dash dotted. And then I'm going to make that plot. So here's the first plot that happened, because I did that plot before I called this. And then here I'm making this call after. Look, dash dotted. Yay. I can do you know, all sorts of things. I'm not going to waste my time on this right now, because we've got to move on. But this RC system is how you can change the defaults. Or you could have just also explicitly stated that you wanted line width equals two and line style equals dash dot. You could have just as easily done that. That is just perfectly valid. We provide multiple ways to do it because different ways suit different use cases. Okay? Uh, those may not, you know, see, you know, you can imagine a situation where you have a script where let's say you're your publication wants a color version of your plots, but also a black and white one. So the color one will be what goes online, while the black and white one is what gets in the paper, hard copy. There, you run the same script, but with two different styles. So it's the same code running, same uh, images being generated, just with two different styles applied. It makes things easy that way to do that. All right. And then, uh, yeah, customizing matplotlib, that's how you can go, uh, talk about how you can uh, load up different styles and how you can customize different styles and things to uh, your liking. All right. Leave pages. Okay. Section five, artists. This is the last big section, uh, quote unquote, but hopefully it won't take too long to do this. Well, it better not take too long to do this because we don't have much time. Um, Okay, artist. So I mentioned this before. Anything that you're seeing in the figure, anything that is visible, is an artist, including the figure itself. The figure is actually technically an artist. So anything that can draw, be drawn, is an artist. And this is the base bean object, if you will, if you come from Java. This is our Java bean, if you will. This is the common uh, thing that gets shared and used throughout. And we have this hierarchy of artists. So you have a figure artist, an axis artist, axis artist, things like that. It's all just a hierarchy. It works together. We also have many different kinds of subclasses of artists uh, for their drawing. So we have primitives and we have containers. So figures and axes and axes, they're all container types. Meanwhile, circles, polygons, lines, markers, things like that, those are all primitives. They're the, the raw things that get drawn. Let's take a look at a list of a variety of them. We have wedges, arrows, line 2D, rectangle, ellipse, fancy box patch, path patch, polygon, and circle. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's actually a few more than this, this, but this is probably the main ones you'll ever come across. Um, and they have all different kinds of parameters and stuff that you can do to uh, uh, parameterize them and use them and customize however you darn well feel. Um, these artists, you're probably wondering, like, why am I now talking about this? this all, all those plotting functions that we've made, those things all create these, create what you see from these artists. And so you can now imagine, yeah, we have this list of all these plotting functions that are all very useful, but what if, what if they're not suitable for what you want? What if they're not really plotting what you like? You could make your own plotting function by loading up the data, by pa passing in data, passing in a set of keyword arguments for uh, properties, and saying, OK, I'm going to generate these artists, this you know, tuple of artists or whatever. And that's what you return. But you will also add these artists into the axes. You'll see an example of that in a second of what uh, happens. 
Um, do, 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 do. So you'll see uh, here I create a path, a patch collection. I give it some some of the data, and I have to explicitly add that collection to the axes. I have to explicitly add the line to the axes. Um, so you have so th these are all the sort of things that you didn't have to do when you made a plotting function, but or when you called a plotting function, but when you make a plotting function, yes, you're going to generate these artists, and you're going to say, okay, you're going to go in this axis, you're going to go in that axis, you're going to, uh, you have to do all this tedious uh, bookkeeping to make sure everything's there. But once you add them, they all will become first class citizens, just like all your other plotting functions you've made. Uh, so you can interact with them, you can do all sorts of other fun stuff with that. Uh, and so you, we've actually been playing around with some of these artists. So remember when we grab the bar objects from the bar call and plot, you get uh, a list of lines. We can mess around with some of the properties. So we see, you know, here we set the line width of one of the lines to five and set the line width of the other to 10. So and also mess around with the uh, transparency. So you can kind of see the blue through the red and all that stuff. So you could do these sort of uh, things uh, messing around with these artist objects. Um, we can also find out what sort of properties are available. Different artists have different properties that are available. So you can look up what the properties are. We have a get p uh, function in PyPlot. So you can see what all the fun properties are that you can mess around with. Okay, collections. So there's primitive, primitive, and then there's primitive collections. So these are collections of uh, primitives that are implemented in such a way that it takes advantage of the fact that they're all the same thing. They're all lines, or they're all markers, or they're all, so we can do certain optimizations. That's what collections are for. Uh, so here I'm creating a line collection object. It's just simply three lines, but they're all going to have common features about them. They're all going to be common in a sense. They're all going to be handled together in one object. Uh, a single, so I'm going to say that set the color to red. So they're all going to be red. And I'm going to say set the line width to five. They're all going to be a line width of five. See? And then if I wanted to, I could specify a list of colors to use. I could specify a list of line width to use if I wanted to. That's what you can sometimes do with certain things in line collections. Some things you can't specify individual stuff for, but, other, but most things you can. Uh, this allows us to do optimizations, uh, particularly uh, with markers. Could then we say, okay, it's the same marker just over and over and over again. That actually uh, makes things a little bit more efficient in many uh, in many places. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm talking about some of those uh, optimizations for markers. Okay. Uh, so here's one regular poly collection. Uh, so it's going to have five sides. Uh, and I'm, I'm giving it, it's going to be 20 of these uh, things that are going to be made, so 20 comma 2, so I'm getting x, y value 20 times. And here's a, a, a transform thing, you know, so I'm saying I want to put these in data coordinates, trans data, and then I'm going to add that collection in. Again, this is stuff that you most likely never have to deal with, but know that it exists so that when you do run into a situation where you need to make something really custom, you can do it. So these are 20 stars, or uh, 20 pentagons uh, that we put in here. And again, in the interest of time, let's give yourself five gold stars. And you guys know how to cheat by now, right? Solutions. So uh, I even give you a link to uh, the documentation for a star polygon collection. So you want a five-pointed star, and I provide the offsets, you know, the locations of where they're going to be, 
and that they're going to be, and that the offsets are specified in data coordinates. Because I could say that I want them to be in figure coordinates or whatever, but I want, and I want them to be gold. And I want them to be large, 175. I like my stars nice and large. Uh, and to make it easy to see, I, I'm going to give it a black outline. I have four gold stars. So. Yeah. Sorry, it's four five pointed stars. I, I keep getting myself mixed up on that. So, yes. Do you ever wonder when, when you see that a movie was rated four stars, you go, well, what's the scale? Was it out of five? Was it out of eight? Was it out of seven? You just, they don't ever say. So, all right. Last one. The, t the light is at the end of the tunnel. You just don't know if it's a train. <laughs> All right. So the last thing I want to talk about, and really, actually, I should make this section a little bit bigger. When I originally wrote this section, there weren't a lot of other packages available in that, uh, that work off of Matplotlib ever since... Then there's been this explosion of packages building off of Matplotlib. I mentioned a few. There's Seaborn. Uh, Pandas uses uh, Matplotlib for a lot of things, and uh, X, X arrays uses things, and there, there, there's just all sorts of stuff out there. I can't even begin to start enumerating them. Um, but there were certain packages that, for the longest time, they're they were developed by the matplotlib team, but they were not actually included in matplotlib proper. And that is that they're not under the matplotlib namespace. They kept them separate because of a variety of different reasons. Um, and so one of it was uh, that, the, that the feature that it provided was a useful feature, but it didn't quite behave like you totally expect it to be. And so we wanted to avoid confusion and make it clear that these things are useful things, but don't expect it to be exactly like a normal axis object or a normal figure object or things like that. They are separate. They may not obey every single rule. Uh, the other thing is that one of them, base map, the package that I'm trying to kill, um, that I am the maintainer of. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm the perfect maintainer for it because I'm the laziest maintainer. Because I want it to go away. Um, base map, uh, to install base map, you actually need to download and install about 200 some odd megabytes worth of stuff. And so 15 years ago, that was, you got to do that every single time. That was not reasonable to have people have that included as a regular part of the dependency for matplotlib. So we made it separate. So base map is used for plotting maps. So for all the various people who want to do weather plotting and ge geographical plotting and stuff like that, yeah, base map there. Uh, don't use base map for new stuff. You'll find it for old stuff, that, legacy apps and stuff like that. I'm actually supporting base map for, until 2020. That's when the end of life for Python 2.7 comes. When Python 2.7 gets end of life, I'll cut one last release of base map and I'm washing my hands clean of it because base map was, is not written in Python 3. And so I can't, and it's just basically a 10,000 line init file. I'm not kidding you, it's terrible. Um, but it was written 15 years ago and it solved a very important problem back in the day. Uh, its replacement is Cartopy. It is not managed by Matplotlib. It's done by a completely separate organization and group. But we're working on trying to get all the features that are in base map into Cartopy. So there'll be a sprint. Maybe some of you guys might be interested in, if you're interested in uh, map pl plotting and stuff, come on by and try it out, uh, try out Cartopy and such. Um, try to get Cartopy ready for 2020. So, so try to make any, any new code 
that's doing map plotting use Cartopy. Don't use base map. Only use base map if Cartopy can't do the job. Um, and then report that as a bug to Cartopy. Mplot 3D is packaged with matplotlib. So if you install matplotlib, by default, you'll get mplot 3D. These are fake 3D plots. I'm also speaking about this as the maintainer of mplot 3D. I keep getting all the crap stuff, I know. Um, I said, seriously, I just needed it for one semester and then because I touched it, I go, your germs. <laughs> yeah, that is the danger of open source programming is that when you do fix a bug, you become the de facto maintainer because you're the last one that looked at the code. So do be careful. This is the lesson I learned 10 years ago. I know nothing about 3D plotting. I just needed one pretty plot 10 years ago. Okay, um, so mplot 3D, it does um, fake 3D plotting. It is not great, but what is nice is that unfortunately all the real 3D plotting that's available out there don't act at all like matplotlib. And so if you wanted to do this, this thing right here, you just saw that it was actually fairly simple and it, this looks a lot like your other uh, commands that you've done. Plot, dot, subplots, you got your figure and your axes. You just have to add one additional uh, argument. You have to say that you're using 3D projection. That's not an unreasonable request. I grab some data and I make a wireframe. These look like plotting commands that you've been used to in matplotlib. In other packages out there, Myavi, uh, VTK, things like this, you can't do that. This is not possible. You have to specify everything. You, you, it's utterly insane and you have to, I, it, it, if you just wanted to make this one plot, because you got this one little bit, you have to go through so much work to make that happen in the real 3D plotting stuff. We do fake 3D plotting here. Don't make complex scenes and you'll be okay. And what I mean by complex scenes is that if you have, let's say, bar, you know, 3D bar graphs, and then you also have lines going in and around it, it won't work properly because you're gonna get these Escher effects where things are in front of other things but they're really behind and stuff. It's, it looks like you're looking at an Escher painting because it just doesn't look physically real. Uh, that's because matplotlib is not a real 3D rendering library, it's a 2D rendering library. We just came up with a fake way of approximating it in certain ways and the other beautiful thing is that it is interactive. You can rotate this thing around. All I'm doing is clicking and holding my mouse and moving my mouse around. That's all I'm doing. And then with your right mouse, the right mouse button, yeah. This feels like matplotlib, doesn't it? So the one thing you can't do, and no, this feature is not being implemented anytime soon, is log scale. Matplot, mplot 3D does not use the transform system. It should, but it doesn't. Um, that's because this stuff was written 15 years ago before the transform system existed and I made an attempt to make it work. Yeah. So, and you need the transform system in order to do the log scale stuff. So, one day maybe I'll have the time to do it, but like I said, I only needed one pretty picture 10 years ago, okay? It's not my itch anymore. Axis Grid 1, this is a really, really neat package in uh, MPL toolkits. Um, oh, by the way, you notice that it's called MPL toolkits because you know, you're not importing from matplotlib, you're from MPL toolkits. But this is not a separate package you install, it comes with matplotlib. So you install matplotlib, you get this, these two packages as well. You know, it, 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 you know buy one, get two free. Um, so Axis Grid 1, it's called Axis Grid 1 because there was actually a previous one called Axis Grid and it was actually the, the old version of it. Use Axis Grid 1 now. Um, but it can do all sorts of really neat things. I'm just going to demo one of it, uh, just a couple features right now. So here, it's really easy to create a color bar that spans 
this, and then notice that the tick labels automatically disappeared for the interior stuff, so that way they're not running into each other, things like that. Neat. Uh, and then this is another, this is like, just like one of those ooh, ah, things, and uh, this is called parasite axes, um, where here you'll see, so you saw here, this is the twinning, the twinning feature that I've showed off before. Note with twinning, as I pan and zoom this stuff around, things move nicely. Why do I feel like I missed something? I don't know. Um, the legend here is moving around automatically. I feel like I missed a complete section. I don't know. Anyway, um, we don't have time to go back to it, so oh well. Uh, yeah, I, I must have completely skipped the session on uh, legends. Legends are generated automatically. Uh, you just have to say that you want to turn it on. So you say axe.legend, and it will automatically add it in there. And then note that it moved around to get out of your way. You know, see if uh, MATLAB ever does that for you. So, yeah. No, no, this is one of the reasons why this is an MPL toolkit, is that right now I'm moving only one of these. It, it, in a real twinning situation, you would actually be moving both sides, so things would actually be behaving like you would expect it to. But here, this is the parasite axis. That's, that's the feature that's being shown, showed off here. It's, it's this third one over here. If you ever wanted to have that feature available, you can do that. Um, and then finally, this is the ooh and aahing moment. Yeah, this is the other thing that you can do with Axis Grid. Uh, people like this for some reason. Uh, I, like I could see use in this uh, and possibly this. I have no idea why one would ever want to do that. Um, but yeah, and it actually still works with the, well, it, yeah, it's a fake. Yeah, again, this is why it's a MPL toolkit and not in Matplotlib proper because it's not actually doing a real thing because you can't actually pan and zoom this stuff as you would expect. But, you know, if you just need to make something that looks like that and you don't care about all that interactivity, it's right there for you. So I provide the link for the documentation for Axis Grid 1. Uh, you could take a look, it has a lot of features and a lot of very useful stuff in there. Really useful, especially when you're having to deal with many images uh, with shared color bars or multiple color bars for multiple images and things like that. So, all very useful. Thank you guys so much for coming and for sitting through uh, my terrible, utterly horrible jokes. Please give yourself a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>